Hi Ananda, I think you need to unmute. Cannot hear. Hi Shubhan. Hi, how are you? Good, good. So too much of you in one week. <laughs> I was gonna say long time. No see. <laughs> Hi Upender. Hi. So now you are an expert in Microsoft Teams. Well, uh. Today I downloaded it. I uh, downloaded the app, so like it's gonna be. I think it's going to be better than last time when I was using the browser. Yeah, I think the functionality, if you use the browser to you go through the browser, I think is somewhat limited. And you also appear as guest if you are using the browser. If you use the Teams app, then you show up as you. Okay. Like Gian, Gian is, I think, using the browser. Hi, Amanda. Hi, everyone. Is that Gian? Hi. Yes, Ronda. Hi, Gian. Hi, everyone. Uh, Do you guys get to see each other? Virtually. <laughs> we are still not open. I guess Texas is. Not. So, uh, Nanda, right now I see only you on the screen and every every other name at the bottom. So, is there a way to kind of uh, have multiple, uh, like it happens in Zoom, you can kind of uh, have a gallery? But, yeah, I mean, uh, the functionality is there. They just, they just, they just uh, chosen to hide their video. Okay, okay. Mute their video. Okay, okay. So, if people unmute your, their videos, then like Upender, Upender unmute. The video. He'll show up in the part. Right now I see. Okay, okay, okay. Good, good. Okay. So once you start your presentation, he'll show up on the board, just like me. That's good. Upender, you're on mute. Yeah, yeah. No, I said if you have the app, you can be sitting in the mountains. Otherwise, you you only have the regular <laughs> background, I think. And and uh, Nanda, I haven't yet figured out where he's sitting at. I'm in space right now. Yeah. It's two o'clock. I think uh, we should begin, or are we waiting a few more minutes? I can I start. We have 19 participants here. So I don't know. Um, yeah, maybe we should start. Okay, then uh, I'm going to share my slides. Now you can see my slides, right? Yes. OK, nice. So uh, before before I start, I would like to thank uh, um, the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present this work at the conference. I would also like to thank all of you for joining this session. As you can see, I'm going to talk about educational inequality and reservation policy in developing markets. This is a joint work with Wenning Bao at University of Connecticut and uh, GNE at Hopkins. Now, I think most people will, would agree that one of the main problems facing uh, developing markets is uh, poverty, right? 
And as soon as that problem comes to mind, uh, the, the question that comes to mind is how can we get these people out of poverty? Right. So what I did, I searched on Google how to overcome poverty and I clicked on the first link that showed up. Uh, nothing surprising there. Um, if we want to get someone out of poverty, we need to educate them. Right? If you look at ideas from uh, influential people like uh, Malala or Barack Obama, they all seem to suggest that that uh, uh, education is the way if you want to go uh, out of poverty, right? So there is this common understanding that education uh, plays a pivotal role in the ability of uh, poor to move up the income ladder. Yet, poor are not studying. In the US, uh, almost 80% of high school, high income high school graduates start college. Uh, this is not about completing college, this is starting college compared to only 45% low income high school graduates. So these are starting college. If you look at the um, developing markets like um, India, China, other countries, you'll see that a disproportionate number of rich students are studying at premier colleges. In fact, the likelihood of a student's admission to IIT quadruples as household income increases from 1500 to 6000 per year. Right? So there is this educational inequality or education achievement gap. And to be specific here, when I say educational inequality in this paper, it's going to be that the probability of a rich student getting admitted in college is higher than the probability of a poor student getting admitted in college, right? So given there is educational inequality, the question that we ask in this paper is, in the context of developing markets, what are some of the important drivers of educational inequality? Now, in, in many of these uh, developing markets, Policy makers have tried, have made an effort to put more, more poor or disadvantaged people in colleges. And one of the ways they have tried to achieve that is by using a policy a reserve, called a reservation policy. So we are going to look at the effect of this reservation policy on students' welfare. Right. So what this reservation policy is, it basically reserves uh, a proportion of seats for disadvantaged or, or poor students. So now given that this, this paper is going to be about higher education in the context of developing markets, uh, I'm going to summarize some of the key features of college education in developing markets. And there uh, you'll see how, how it is different from, from education in, in developed economies, right? So uh, first in developing markets, if you look at best colleges, they are all public colleges and they are heavily subsidized. So cost of attending college is never a barrier for attending college. Admissions to these colleges are based on a single admissions test. For example, if you want to get into IIT in India, all that you need to do is clear JEE. That's the exam that you need to clear. Um, it doesn't matter whether you are a star sports person, you play wonderful piano. Uh, all that matters is your score on that one test. Now, the more selective the college is, the more rewarding it is for admitted students. And what students do is they start very early in their lives um, start preparing for admissions to these these uh, uh, colleges or for these tests like like JEE, and they study hard for it. And once they get admitted into into these colleges, it doesn't matter whether whether they are rich, poor, what what uh, what uh, um, demographic group they belong to. Graduation rates are are near perfect. 
also in in developing markets household income is very difficult to verify right so uh, household income is difficult to verify because uh, because of weak institutions uh, informal economy corruption um, if you ask someone that you know i i need a certificate to prove that you are a poor student maybe a rich student has an easier time getting that certificate than a poor student uh, uh, most low income students belong to belong to i'll say one identifiable characteristic but you you can think of if you're thinking about um, about china maybe they come from certain rural parts of china if you're thinking about area about india then you think about that most of them come from uh, scheduled caste or scheduled tribe uh, groups right so uh, most of most low income students belong to uh, one identifiable characteristic and most high income students will belong to other uh, other uh, characteristics for example they can be urban students or they can be uh, general category students many as i said before many developing market policy makers have made an attempt to reduce educational inequality by implementing reservation and uh, or, or some places they uh, these policies are called quota policies and uh, I, I grew up thinking that this kind of reservation policy happens only in india because uh, i was in india but uh, uh, i realized that uh, many many developing markets like uh, Malaysia, uh, Sri Lanka, South Africa, Brazil, China, uh, Turkey, they all have uh, some kind of uh, a, a reservation policy. Um, these policies, what they do is they reserve a proportion of college seats for students with certain identifiable characteristics, right? Or another way of thinking about it is that they transfer seats uh, among among student groups, so a, a college seat that would otherwise have gone to uh, a, a general category student, now that seat is reserved for a, a scheduled cost or scheduled tribe student, or uh, a college seat that would have otherwise gone to a, a student from from the city is now reserved for a student from a village. Right? Now another imp another. Uh, Another thing that I want to point out is that uh, in, in developing markets, these uh, uh, disadvantaged students are not minority students, right? We, when we are thinking about developed countries, we often think that they are minority students. No, uh, we are not talking about minority students. We are talking about uh, about a large segment of population, right? So the, these are these are the features that. Uh, we capture in our model when we are uh, trying to study educational inequality and the effect of uh, the reservation policy. Right now, here uh, I would like to uh, point out one more thing: is that uh, uh, some people argue that the policy makers don't really have this goal of reducing educational inequality when they implement um, reservation policy. Right, so. Uh, some some politicians have just the you know re-election concern, uh, and that's why they want to implement uh, reservation policy. So here it doesn't matter what is there behind, what's the background story for why a particular developing market has implemented reservation policy. What we are going to study in this paper is. What is the effect of that reservation policy on the welfare and educational inequality? Okay. So I'll, I'll quickly summarize the main contributions and main results before going in the details of the model. Uh, what, what we do, uh, what is new in this paper? Uh, we consider student moral hazard. Right, how hard a student studies for the test, and we also consider that reward from attending college is selectivity dependent. Right now, as a result of considering student moral hazard and selectivity dependent reward for college education, we derive some interesting new insights. First, 
what we find is that educational inequality arises in our model and it arises in the model because low income students do not have resources to make monetary investment toward, towards test preparation. Right? So this main result is, you know, sometimes I like to put it like not a main result, but a feature that educational inequality uh, comes from, from low income students inability to spend money to prepare for the test. We find that students who do not receive the policy benefit. Uh, think about general general category students in India or our students from cities. They respond to, to the policy by studying harder. We also find that a reservation policy may be more effective in markets where low income students are minority. And finally, we show that this policy may hurt higher income students from predominantly low income characteristic groups, uh, particularly in emerging markets. Right? So uh, higher income students from predominantly low income group uh, I'm referring to uh, rich students from villages or uh, rich students from schedule cost categories. Right? And what we show is that the policy may actually hurt them. I'm going to skip the related literature uh, in the interest of time. And so uh, Yes. Can I, can I uh, interrupt and ask you a question? So if you go please, back to the actually, slide, actually, uh, actually, um, it's a little bit surprising that like 15 minutes without questions. Please, please interrupt me anytime you have a question. Please don't wait until I finish the presentation. Yeah, no, please. You know, we never do that at UTT. So, <laughs> um, so if you go back to the previous slide. Um, you know, to me, the first two results seem fairly obvious. Um, Is there something uh, that I'm missing? Um, no, you're not missing. If, if they appear obvious to you, uh, maybe because you are very familiar with the context, um, that, that's that's uh, um, totally fine. Totally fine. No, I'm, I'm even absent the, you know, um, being privy to the context, I think uh, the fact that you know it's a it's a, there's a demand supply thing, right? You have limited seats, um, and then if you don't have money to prepare for the test, mm -hmm. uh, you know the education inequality is going to be there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, the, I mean, educational inequality is there can be there for for other reasons also, but here in this model we are uh, we are arguing that we are basically studying that ed the educational inequality that arises because of low income students inability to spend money for preparing uh, preparing for coaching. OK. So a different question. I mean, I know that you've been talking about developing economies, but I'm thinking that if I look at implication uh, one or two, it seems that it would apply to U.S. Uh, college education as well, right? So maybe even three and four, um, depending on what the model setup is. But I'm thinking that in the U.S. also, because of affirmative action admission policies, uh, Asian students work harder. So yeah, that's well uh, known. I, I I agree that some of the some of the implications uh, or you know the results may apply to to other uh, markets as well. But uh, as you'll see that uh, you know, some of the model features are not, you know, like uh, people can question that, well, this, this is not about, uh, about this doesn't happen in, in developed markets. So I, I don't want to claim that this, this is more general than, than the model um, fits, fits nicely. To. Just That's to right. add to that, Shubhranshu, I think you know uh, the minority, the quotas that you're talking about are for certain sort of groups that you said are identifiable, right? Mm -hmm. Similarly, here in the US also, if you think about the sports quota, 
How is that different? Um, sports quota. OK, I, I didn't think about that, but uh, um, it, it's not different in the sense that, you know, the effect of quota, how it is going to uh, uh, change the uh, change the. But the, is the goal of sports quota eliminating um, educational inequality? Uh, maybe the goal is something else, right? Encouraging sports uh, or getting a, a more interest uh, from from more I'm, general. Like, no, I'm, I'm not sure what the goal is. Clearly, the goals are multiple, but I think yeah. it ends up, um, you know, reducing uh, inequality, right? Because a lot of the basketball players or football players that end up you know, if there was no sports quota, would they get the education that they get? Um, yeah, I mean that that's that's a, a slightly different debate, but I think uh, uh, are they actually getting the same quality of education or or uh, same education as a, a non student, non uh, sports quota student? Um, do they receive the same benefit um, that that all can um, can be you know something to think about, but uh, you know I, I agree that many of these points uh, uh, findings right you you need to kind of think about yes uh, it, does it make sense can I extrapolate based on the intuition right because these results will have intuitions and those the the story may fit uh, different places so I'm not saying that no it doesn't fit any other place it's just for this. But uh, as long as the story fits, I think the, the uh, results can be uh, applied in other contexts as well. Subranshu? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so actually, so Nanda just said uh, the first two points was uh, are kind of obvious to him, but actually it, to me, the second point is less obvious, uh, at least for me because I can think of a counter argument is that after the policy for students who don't receive the policy, uh, it becomes like more uh, even harder for them to get into the uh, top universities. So they start, start stop starting hard. Yeah, right? So yeah. I, I think the second point is like uh, at least less obvious to me. So uh, and uh, it's very interesting that your result, your result only find that the students always respond by studying harder. So let, let's let's see the, the model and then the intuition will, will become clear. Uh, but uh, like when I talk to, to different people, right, different people have different ideas about this one makes more sense, this one doesn't make uh, as much sense. So we'll see uh, what results are there and uh, why why they make sense or they do not make sense. Okay. I think uh, don't worry about the intuition right now. Once I describe the model, right, it, it will become clear uh, about about the uh, like why all this ha is happening. But if there are any questions about about these features, uh, I would want to answer that before I uh, before I go to the model. If you have any questions about about the, the features that we are modeling. OK, so, so uh, let, let's move on and look at the model. Uh, we have a mass one of students uh, competing for college admissions. And a proportion alpha of these students are higher income students. These higher income students, they can afford to make monetary investment towards admission test preparation. And a proportion one minus alpha are low income students. They do not have money to, to uh, buy private tutoring. A student I can be of type X or Y. And this is an identifiable characteristic of the student in the society. Oh, Shubhansha, I have a good question. Yeah. Um, the higher income, are they, do they have to be majority and then low income minority? No, no. So as you can see right here, alpha varies between zero and one. So right, right, right. What, what we are saying is we are going to look at the entire range and see how Alpha being small or large uh, uh, 
makes a difference. Does it make oh, a difference? Right. Yeah, okay, fine. Yeah, thank you. So a student I's type is, you know, X or Y. Think of think of type X is as a, as a general category or a city student type Y as a scheduled cost to do scheduled tribe or, or a rural student. So um, most of these type X students are high income students. So a high, if you pick a high student income in the population, this student is very likely going to be a type X student. And if you pick a type Y student, sorry, a low income student, this student is very likely going to be a type Y student, right? So we capture that by a parameter beta, which is greater than half. Uh, now let's look at the college admissions prep, right? So students, uh, if they can afford, they decide whether they want to invest kappa in education to enhance their productivity or not. So once students who can afford have decided, then all students simultaneously study for the test. They they put they decide how much effort they want to put uh, towards test preparation, and this effort is costly. Uh, the cost is quadratic, and uh, and this investment kappa and the effort that is put to study that results in students' preparedness AI. Right. So if a student puts monetary investment kappa, then student realizes her full potential and the preparedness is EI. And if the student does not invest in, in productivity enhancement, then the student fails to realize her full pot potential and preparedness is phi times EI, where phi is less than one. Now, all these students, they take the test for admission to a, a college which has limited admissions capacity. Remember, we have one mass one of students. The admissions capacity is less than half. The probability of admission for a specific student I increases with the preparedness AI, and it decreases in D, DZ, where DZ is the college selectivity. So if the college is highly selective, then the probability will be lower. And where do we get this, coll uh, this uh, college selectivity? It comes from, from this uh, um, seat clearing condition. Basically, you have Z seats available and you just set the size of admissions to equal the seats available and that gives uh, DZ that how selective the college is. Students payoff after attending college is B times DZ. Basically, it equals the selectivity of the college if student is admitted and if student is not admitted, it is normalized to zero. Sorry, uh, any questions about the model setup? Uh, so, so just yeah. I mean, uh, just because you asked, but uh, you don't have to answer this. There, there are many assumptions here about the technologies of uh, um, the preparation, prior background. Uh, maybe you're going to relax that later, uh, but maybe as we progress, we'll see. But it seems like you're making an assumption that all students are starting at the same baseline prior to the uh, test preparation, for example, right? So, so yeah, the, the underlying assumption here is that there is some free educational resources available to all students and then uh, high income students they can get this uh, this phi right so basically they can realize the effect of phi by uh, by putting uh, putting uh, money into it yeah right? i'm so thinking that, no, i yeah. think what upender is saying is that you know two students they put in the same effort the uh, the preparedness may be different I think that's what Subhrash was also saying that because of the uh, uh, or I don't know. No, actually, that's a different point, maybe. But I think uh, Subhrash was answering my question, which is um, when I think about an Indian context, right? So is a student coming from a rural area and joining an IIT coaching class equally prepared to benefit from it as a student? So 
because here it, it is uh, argued money is the only constraint right so so phi right that think about phi is that that captures the effect of whatever is is not available to poor students uh, that money can buy right so more generally you can even think about phi as capturing the effect of uh, you know like uh, uh, access to basic education even uh, poor students are sick uh, more days, right? So the access to health, better health, that also can be thought of that phi, uh, phi is uh, capturing that. No, no, my question is, uh, our student, there, there are two groups, right? I'm, I'm losing a little bit uh, track of uh, income versus something else, but there are, there are basically two groups of people. There are four groups of people. There so are there, are, there are rich uh, type X, rich type Y, poor type X and poor type Y. Yeah, and the assumption is, except for these uh, characteristics, uh, uh, they are equal in every respect. They and are, so they're, they're, yes. So, if, so they, if they take the coaching class, everyone will do equally well. Yes, so a quick pick a student and, and uh, put, make the same resources available as it is available to a rich student, that student will do as well as the rich student does. Right. I mean, I guess it goes to say, I mean, it goes to the question of what is that resource, right? Is it the last two, I mean, at least when I was in India, it was two years of uh, uh, training versus 12 years of training, right? I think 12 years of training is really what it needed to get to those two years finally, right? So think that's about, what I'm thinking about. So think about what get what is needed to get in. And is that a low income student that's something that low income student cannot afford and a high income student can afford. No, no, I think what, what, all I'm trying to say, and I guess I, that's why I was initially saying we can talk about it later. I don't know how crucial it is for your uh, uh, setting. Uh, I think the assumption you're making is all prior education prior to entering that two years of uh, coaching is equal. Every student has got the same background education. Well, yes, this here that I don't think is true in India, for example, right? Okay. So, 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 so to address to that point, right? So, um, yes, here I put that simplifying uh, description uh, that coaching, the expenses for coaching is what Kappa is, but you should think of, uh, you can think of Kappa more generally as whatever you know like right from the time the student is born to the time the student takes the test that extra expense that a, a, a more higher income family puts towards the test preparation including uh, buying nutrition buying uh, you know medication buying lunch and and things like that right so everything uh, can you can think of kappa as buying that yeah. And that enhances the uh, productivity of uh, students' effort. Now, uh, let, let, we can talk about that, uh, you know, further after the presentation. Let, let's move on. Um, so here, right, uh, what happens is educational inequality, not surprising at all that it arises. It arises because higher income students uh, can enhance their productivity uh, because uh, because of the um, investment and that incre increases the probability of their admission. Uh, we also find that uh, on average, higher income students study harder than low income students. Now, this this result that uh, um, higher income students study harder than than low income students that that is uh, you know, people talk about many different reasons for why that happens in developing markets. Remember, I'm talking about it on average. Uh, there are some low income students who actually study much harder than higher income students and they, they get admitted into all kinds of colleges. But uh, on average, high income students study harder and they are able to study harder. Um, if you look more generally, the uh, reasons include um, it, it, you know, um, having food, not uh, needing to work uh, on in the in the farm, uh, 
many different reasons, uh, uh, but here in this model, we get that effort higher because it is just more rewarding for higher income students to study more. Um, low income students, when they get stuck, there is no help to, to uh, explain the concept and maybe that's why they are not studying as much. Uh, we also find that educational inequality increases in the size of higher income students, alpha, and decreases in the admissions capacity, Z. Why is that? Um, as alpha increases or, or Z decreases, uh, college becomes more selective, and as college becomes more selective, it becomes more uh, rewarding for admitted students. Because college becomes more rewarding, all students study harder. But higher income students effort is more effective, therefore they study even harder. Resulting in higher educational inequality. Right? So as alpha increases, alpha increasing means the uh, market becoming more affluent. Right? It's more, more and more higher mm -hmm. income students. Exactly. Yep. So is, is the delta E, the difference between E H and E L, is that decreasing in Z? Um, I would suspect that it is. OK, I don't remember that one. But I think if I had to make a guess, I think it does. Yeah, because, you know, I think it's more like, you know, there's limited capacity, right? So now if you limit the capacity, then the only way the edge type is going to get in is by putting higher effort. <clears throat> yeah. But yeah. if you relax that constraint and increase Z, then I don't work, have to work that hard because there's, imagine there's unlimited capacity, right? So then I can get in without any effort. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So one way, right? One way to uh, reduce educational inequality is to increase uh, admissions capacity Z. Which actually a lot of uh, countries, if you see, right, developing countries, they uh, they they understand that. I mean, the, uh, China and India both have uh, taken very clear steps, uh, and they, if you look at look at the government websites, right, they even uh, acknowledge that this is an effort to uh, to reduce uh, inequality. So uh, if 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 you look at uh, students expected uh, equilibrium payoff uh, as alpha increases from very low, the both high income and low income students, uh, their expected payoff increases. And this increases because the college becomes more selective, more rewarding and uh, becomes uh, get, uh, college education becomes more rewarding. So the payoff increases. But as alpha increases beyond beyond the threshold, uh, low income students become become worse off. Higher income students keep becoming better off. Uh, the reason there is that uh, that as the competition becomes intense, higher income students um, they they put a, a negative externality on on low income students. As alpha increases becomes very high, uh, very few low income students in the market the competition for admission moves primarily to within high income student group and they are both high income and low income students become worse off as a result of increase in alpha. But uh, uh, next, next we look at the effect of uh, reservation policy. So uh, all the discussions so far, there was no reservation policy. Now let's put a reservation policy and what this reservation policy is, um, take some seats from type X students and give it to type Y students. Okay. So what happens as a result of this reservation policy is that type X students respond by studying much harder, right? Two, two reasons for that. One is, now competition is more intense. If they want to get in for uh, fewer seats, they better study harder. The other reason is that the reward for these students is also higher because it's much harder to get in. Those who get in, even in the presence of reservation policy, they are really considered stars among stars, right? So uh, type X students study 
very hard for the test, uh, type Y students effect is exactly the opposite. Why the market reward for type X students in the reservation policy goes down. Why is that? Market understand, market can see that the test cutoff score is much lower for type Y students. College selectivity is much lower for type Y students. Therefore, market is not willing to offer the same reward to type Y students as it offers to type X students, right? So market reward becomes lower, competition is a little bit less intense, and the combined effect is that the equilibrium effort level is, is uh, lower than what it would be in. Uh, Shudransh, can market overtly do that? I mean, think about right. I mean, I, I grew up in India, right? When I was a kid, there was no hesitation uh, visiting a doctor from a scheduled cost category. Now, nobody wants to go to, to that doctor because people think that this doctor is not not uh, not good. I mean, it's, this doctor got into medical school because of the quota policy, and uh, so I, I'm like uh, even in in private sector, like any day-to-day uh, -day interaction, you realize that uh, market understands that that uh, some students who benefited from the reservation policy, they are you know, employers are hesitant to hire them. Um, if they hire them, salaries are not, not the same. Uh, so yes, it, I mean, it, it is happening in developing markets that type X and type Y students do not get the same reward after attending college, right? And this is one way how it is very different from developed markets where uh, we have, uh, you know, affirmative action in the job market as well. And uh, one can argue that type Y and type X students receive the same payoff in the job market. Okay. Sorry for the interruption. You have about five minutes. Okay, thank you. So um, here, here is a, a, a present a proposition. Let me summarize the two key points uh, that I want to make from this proposition, uh, they are that um, this identifiable characteristic based reservation policy is more effective in markets where low income students are minority. The effect in poor developing markets, right? Poor developing markets, their low income students are majority. The effect may be exactly the opposite. And now why the effect is exactly the opposite? Like what is the effect we hope to get that we uh, put this policy, we make type X students worse off, we make type Y students better off, right? So what happens in, in a market where that is filled with poor students, pick an individual poor student. The likelihood of admission for that low income student doesn't change much, but if you look at the cutoff test score, the college selectivity, that drops. The overall effect is that students who get admitted, their, their payoff in the job market is much lower, uh, which makes them worse off. We also find that if you pick a, an affluent student, from, from a disadvantaged group, right? So this is actually a, 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 a scheduled cost student or a rural student who is rich. This student is not necessarily better off as a result of the reservation policy, right? Why is that? Because this student may have made it on her own, but now the job market sees that student and treats that student as if this student benefited from the reservations policy and therefore offers a much lower reward. So these students actually suffer, may suffer. I don't know, that's like an empirical question, but uh, that they may suffer 
as a result of reservation policy, right? We we think that they receive the unfair advantage in, in the market because of this reservation policy, but it may be that they actually suffer because of the reservation policy. I don't know if you, I know you don't have much time, but you know, are there not verifiable uh, things that the 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 Y student can sh show to demonstrate that the the cutoff was you know cutoff was whatever it was, but I was much higher than the cutoff, like transcripts, you know, things yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, they they can, they can, they can. But I mean, if you if you um, look at it, as the example I gave, right, the doctor, the doctor who may have made it on her own, but uh, like an individual consumer is really not going to look at the transcripts or no, I get that. I get so, stuff, yeah. but they just see that this is a, 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 a you know, a, a, a reserved quota uh, doctor and just, you know, right. I get it. it was possible, yeah. if it was possible to clearly like, you know, like, you know uh, transmit that information to everyone, then then uh, I agree with you. Right. I mean, just to quickly add to that, I mean, in India's context, I think uh, what that what what an implication would be, doctors is one kind of profession, but if you look at the private sector, right, the fact that the private sector uh, can interview students and all that, that's good because if the government, as some proposals are there, imposed a employment quota, then that might actually be bad, right? And that could be... Uh, so I, I didn't I didn't uh, talk about that, but it's it's, it's in the paper. And um, one way that it, because right now uh, there is this selectivity dependent reward, but you can kind of counter a little bit by putting uh, making incentives for private sector employers to hire these. You can maybe offer tax benefits or do something that. You know, and to encourage employers to hire higher type Y students, and that can incentivize type Y students to study a little bit harder, and maybe more of them will, will show up. Uh, last result. Uh, this uh, finally, we study the effect uh, effect of the amount of uh, transfer. That how many seats do you want to to reserve? Right. So we de uh, derive that S star, the equilibrium amount of uh, transfer. Uh, you know, just to just to make one uh, point here is that uh, excessive reservation is bad for all students. Why? Because if, when you reserve too many seats, then type X students suffer because very few of them get admitted, and type Y students suffer because their education is considered worthless by the market. Right. So we we think uh, based on our result that there should be a cap on how much how many seats do you want to reserve for and, and some some markets like india uh, the supreme court has put this uh, you know that mm, there is an upper upper limit on how many seats can be reserved for for any type of students so finally to to summarize um, here we derive some interesting insights uh, I feel that the reason we are able to get these new insights is because of the selectivity dependent um, college admissions, college benefit and student moral hazard. Right? We show that uh, we show that educational inequality can endogenously uh, arise in the model where uh, and in the market uh, because low income students cannot afford um, the same facilities as higher income students. Uh, we find that students who do not receive the policy benefit, they respond by studying much harder for the test. We show that the reservation policy may be more effective in markets where poor are minority. We also find that rich students from predominantly low income groups may be worse off as a result of reservation policy, and finally, we show that excessive reservation can hurt overall student welfare. Thank you for all your questions and comments. <clears throat> Bobby, you're next. Is it possible for me to request control? How, how do I uh, start sharing my screen? 
Ali, can you help? Uh, you should. I don't. Let me see. You are a member. You can uh, share your screen. So Bobby, yeah. a, everyone can arrow, take control. There is an arrow on the top right next to the leave button. Yeah. There, there should be an icon like upload, right? There, there should be a square with an up, up arrow. Oh, oh, give me one second. I, I see it. You should have been practicing this since last month. <laughs> He needs a coaching class. Hey, Tanjim. Ali, do you have his uh, file? I don't have his file. I just connected the presenters and the discussants. I didn't connect them. Uh, but he is the discussant. Uh, uh, yeah, I just have the presenters. Uh, I see. Can you can you all see my slides now? Not no, yet. I can't. Have you shared your screen? Uh, so I yes, share, I, I can see your slides. You can? Yes. Yes, I can too. Oh, perfect. I so I cannot. I, okay, let me see. Uh, how about now? Yes, no. I can see. How's that is, possible? Is everybody else able to see it? I don't I'm, see. I'm sorry no, for the mess no. that I've created. Why don't you leave and join? Uh, okay, let, let me try that. Okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Does that answer your question? Um, okay. That's fine. I mean, it seems to suggest that they knew already that speaking in a particular way would. Yeah. Nandar, can you see it now? Yes, we yes. can see it. Okay, should I, can I go ahead and get started? Yes, please. All right, so uh, a big shout out to the uh, conference committee. Thank you for having me as uh, an discussant. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed reading this paper for three reasons. Uh, so first of all, this is an incredibly important research topic. In fact, after browsing through the entire conference schedule, this is the only paper on education. And secondly, uh, I find the model to be very clean and very elegant. And thirdly, uh, this paper has generated some, some of the most striking results that have profound policy implications. So the first thing I wanted to point out is that uh, education inequality is uh, incredibly prevalent, at least in China, where I was born and where I grew up. For example, you can see that uh, in the rural areas in China, where it has over 60% of the population, the educational investment only accounted for 23% versus the 77% uh, of educational investment in the urban areas, 
that only has less than 40% of the entire population. Secondly, I wanted to share with you some of the interesting data where uh, we're talking about gross ratio of higher education, which means that what's the percentage of college aged young adults that are actually in universities? The ratio is one over two in Beijing and the national average is 15%, while some southwestern part of China, such as Yunnan, is only uh, one over 12, right? So you can see this gigantic educational inequality across uh, this one particular emerging market, China. And lastly, uh, this is sort of the, the single college entrance exam that's going to determine a lot of kids' uh, life in China. And uh, Shubhranshu was talking about the, the quota policy. And that translates to bonus points for certain groups in rural areas in China. Okay, They are able to get maybe 20 additional points or even 10 uh, additional points. And finally, this is my last slide on the mo motivation. Uh, in 2015, the premier of China, Ke Qiangli, said the following. I have uh, bolded his uh, statement. He's saying that educational e equality is the single most important social justice in China. Uh, you need to know that uh, I have taken this from the official government website, uh, www.gov.cn. So this is sort of one of the most uh, a credible uh, source of information in China. And uh, given the importance of this context, Xu Brangxu and his co-authors set out to answer the uh, central research question, which is how does this quota policy influence educational inequality, especially in emerging markets? And as a result, what's the impact on the overall student's welfare? Very briefly, this paper nicely captures three important characteristics of higher education in emerging markets. The first is that college admission is solely based on test results, and it's incredibly competitive. I'm just going to use uh, Tsinghua as an example. So the admission rate of Tsinghua in China uh, varies across uh, regions. And it can be anywhere between 0.04% to 0.01%. So on the paper, you can think about sort of uh, Tsinghua being even more selective than a, a bunch of Ivy schools here in the States. And the second feature this paper captures is that uh, there are significant investment in private lessons and tutoring and so on and so forth, at least for some households. I'm going to give you a data, uh, a data point, which is uh, up to 20% of each household's disposable income in China has been spent on uh, private lessons, okay, private tutoring. And lastly, uh, it's pretty hard to observe the financial resources of each student, uh, unlike here in the States where you can check on students' parents' tax record, right? That's probably not feasible in China or in India. Now, given those research uh, questions and the features of the model, I'm just going to very quickly uh, show you some of the key setups of the model. Think about two different types of students, X and Y. And I want you to think about type X as students from the urban area and type Y as students from the rural area. Now, a student from the urban area uh, is not necessarily of high income, but uh, conditioning on a student being a high income student, he's more likely to be from the urban area and vice versa, right? That's the reason why you have this parameter beta that's greater than one half. And Students make costly efforts, uh, which is captured by this cost convex cost function C of EI. And uh, what's uh, new about this particular context is that if students are wealthy, then they can make this additional investment, kappa, such that their effectiveness of their studying efforts is higher than their counterparts who do not have the financial resources to make such investment of kappa. That's the reason why you see this parameter phi, which is smaller than one. So this phi captures the, the quality of the free basic education. And then uh, there are alpha fraction of the students in the market who are rich kids. You can think of them as rich kids and uh, they're able to uh, uh, deliberate and think about whether or not to make this investment of kappa. And as a result, enhance the effectiveness of their uh, efforts. And finally, and I really point, want to point out that this is one of those uh, really neat and elegant uh, moment, uh, elegant elements in this model, which are captured by the last two bullet points on this slide. 
So the second, uh, the second uh, uh, last bullet point states that the admission probability is positively correlated with one's uh, effectiveness of uh, his or her studies, which is increases, which increases in AI, and decreases in how selective a college is, which is given by D of Z. And lastly, Z captures a college uh, capacity constraint, and because of this uh, market clearing condition, uh, uh, the authors are able to obtain uh, the equilibrium outcomes. All right. I have uh, a Sorry couple for the interruption. You have less than two minutes, about sure. two minutes. The, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just very briefly highlight uh, one result that I really, really liked, uh, which is here, which states that the educational inequality increases when we have more higher income students and it decreases in university's capacity Z. So if you think about it, what does this mean? This means that as a particular country, let, let me use the example of China, right? As China becomes richer, so there are more higher income students, ARFA, one of the ways to combat educational inequality is to increase the sizes, the capacities of the universities in China. Now, this is exactly what happened in China. So uh, this slide basically gives you the supporting empirical evidence of uh, the three co-authors paper, which uh, I'm going to highlight as a following, okay? In 1996, the gross higher education ratio in China was uh, 8.3, and then this ratio jumped, doubled, okay, uh, after six years in 2002, and then uh, this this ratio becomes 23% uh, in 2008, and two years ago, in 2019, the national average becomes over 50%. So this is exactly consistent with what Xu Branshu and his co-authors are are suggesting, right? Okay, given the time constraints, I'm gonna skip, you know, a couple of slides. I, let me just- hey, Just to quickly clarify, what is the, what is that ratio again? The so, so the ratio is, uh, what's the percentage of college aged young adults who are actually right. in colleges right. in, in China? Thank you. Sure. All right. Uh, let me uh, let me just say a couple of things very quickly. The first thing I'm wondering when I was reading this paper is that what if uh, the authors can uh, you know simplify the model even further by assuming that all college graduates receive the same payoff from the job market? Okay, uh, so this is one of the, the the thoughts that I have. The second thoughts that I have is that what if the students' efforts, in addition to their private tutoring investment is additive instead of multiplicative. Would that change anything? OK, uh, I'm just going to conclude, given the time constraint. So the first thing I wanted to conclude is that, uh, based on the definition from OECD, there are two dimensions of equality in, in education. One of the dimensions is inclusion, or you might call it diversity. This is exactly what the authors have been uh, trying to address. Uh, and study the implication of reservation policy or quota policy uh, on, right? But there's another dimension, which is fairness, that I think in the future, uh, it might be uh, worthwhile to pursue. And secondly, I wanted to highlight some of, uh, some of the, I think, incredible empirical research opportunities uh, with quota experiments, because next year, Anhui province in China is going to become the first uh, province in China to completely eliminate this quota policy. And then Jiangxi and Tianjin and some other provinces in the next uh, four to five years are going to follow suit and get rid of this uh, sort of a reservation policy. And it'd be really fascinating to study their uh, strategic impact on student welfare. And, and finally, I just want to highlight that Xu Branshu and his co-authors, uh, Wei Ning and, and Jian, have a series of uh, really interesting papers on emerging markets and societal impact. And, and uh, <laughs> If you haven't had a chance to read, for example, uh, Xu Branshu's paper uh, on uh, competition in corruptible markets, or uh, Wei Ning, Xu Branshu, and Jian's paper on informal lending mer em emerging markets, I highly recommend you to do so. All right, thank you. Thank you, Bobby. Thank Bobby, can you share, uh, send the slides to us? Can we sure, absolutely. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for all your questions and comments.
next up next up is sohail right is that right yes that's right so what do i do do i share a screen now that's right yeah hey sohail hi um okay i think should probably should really raise the bar let's see what happens okay um let me find Professor Vinit Kumar is also joining us. Oh, hello, Vinit. Nice background. Looks like Vinit is giving a TED talk. Yeah, no, Vinit, Vinit looks larger than life. <laughs> At this camera angle. Hey, Vinit. How are you? Good. Hey, Upen, there you seem to be having a very cool background. Yeah, I'm I'm not valley. in Dallas anymore. Yeah, you look like you're a valley guy now, mountains and valley guy. <laughs> right? Yeah. Oh, look at look at Nanda. Wow, really, you know, transporting himself back. I'm still trying to understand how you have a palm tree or what is it, plantain tree, and then all those 16th century runes, right? What is it? Windmill and stuff like that. I can't. I, you're muted. Tra and, uh, I've traveled back in time. Okay. So does everybody see um, my screen now, or? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So I think I can get started whenever, uh, whenever you guys are ready. Actually, I also have a question. How do I see my own screen? And uh, so what do you see now? Do you see my PowerPoints or do you see now your faces? We see our faces. OK, cool. And now you see the PowerPoint, but now I don't see anybody. But that's fine. I think I can go like this. Sorry, it's because I'm used to Zoom and I'm not quite familiar with how things work on Microsoft Teams. But I mean, I guess because we have uh, Vinice, because Vinice is also here, then if you ask questions on the chat, then he can answer. And if you unmute yourself and ask me, I'm going to hear and, and, and try to answer. That sounds good? Yeah. <clears throat> OK, so I think we can get started whenever you want me to. You can start. OK. Um, thank you, the organizers, for uh, organizing this conference and for uh, giving us the opportunity to present this paper. And thanks, everybody else, for coming. The title is Spatial Distribution of Supply and the Role of Market Thickness, Theory and Evidence from Ride Sharing, and it's co-authored with Vineet Kumar, also from Ye. All right, so let me start with some background. Spatial markets are complex, and this is because in these markets, not only do we deal with uh, how much supply and demand there are, but we also deal with uh, where supply and demand take place. And that leads to a series of interesting and challenging questions about the functioning of these markets. Um, a main one would be, what is the spatial distribution? Like now we have spatial distribution of supply and demand in these markets rather than just the amount of supply and demand. And one question would be, what is the spatial distribution of supply? And does it match or mismatch with that of potential demand? And this gets complicated because each supplier, when deciding where to operate, where to supply, is impacted not only by how much demand there is, but also by externalities from other suppliers. For example, a main one would be economies of density, a main one of these externalities, which is kind of also the focus of this paper. Another question about these markets would be, is the equilibrium spatial distribution of supply efficient? And by that, I mean either from the perspective of a social planner or from the perspective of, say, a platform, which is what we focus on in this paper. We focus on rideshare. You can think of whether or not the spatial distribution of drivers across a city is considered optimal from the perspective of the rideshare platform or the platform would like to change that somehow. And this gets complicated again because of the issue of externalities. Each supplier, in this case, each driver, decides where to operate 
And in that decision, and making that decision, he or she incorporates the externalities left on him or her by other suppliers, that person does not consider the externalities that he or she leaves on others. But the platform does internalize those, and that could sort of create a wedge between the incentives of the platform and those of the drivers. Another challenging question, this time on the empirical side, is how to empirically measure uh, spatial supply-demand mismatch. And this is hard because when you want to measure whether different areas are different from each other in terms of what proportion of their potential demand gets uh, unfulfilled, this is not easy because unfulfilled demand is not observable. You don't see who would have wanted a ride or would have wanted a product and didn't get it. And this is what this paper is focused on. This paper tries to answer these questions and study them in the context of ride sharing and discuss their implications. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to overview the answers that we give. So, so if I run out of time and I don't have enough time to go through all the details, at least I will have reviewed uh, the findings. Starting with the theoretical questions, what we do is we first uh, characterize the equilibrium spatial distribution of drivers, and we show that in the equilibrium, this distribution is skewed towards region with higher demand density. Just to illustrate it, if region I has twice as much demand per square mile, as region J, then in the equilibrium, it's going to get, say, three times as much supply. Okay, so the supply is going to be bigger in that region, even after normalizing by its bigger demand. The second thing that we show is on the efficiency side, from the perspective of the platform, we show that the platform desires some skew in the spatial distribution of supply relative to that of potential demand, but not as much as it arises in, e in equilibrium naturally. Just to sort of build upon the Previous illustrative example, if region, high, if region I has twice as much demand per square mile as region J and gets three times as much supply, maybe the platform would want it to get two and a half times as much supply. All right. And we show the platform's optimal strategy would involve an, an encouragement of a more even but not fully even distribution of drivers through using wages and prices as levers. And I'm going to be specific later on how these levers are used. And finally, we show that all of the above are more pronounced, all less equal for, smart, for smaller platforms. So that's what we do on the theory side. On the empirical side, the objective that we have is to empirically test for two implications of the model. One is economies of density, namely demand is more likely to go unfulfilled and less dense region. And the second is that economies of density is more pronounced for smaller platforms. These are the things that we test empirically. And as I mentioned, testing them is challenging because unfulfilled demand is not observed. If one region has lower activity than another region, you can't really tell how much of it is because of lower potential demand and how much of it is because of lower supply. And what we do is we, I'm gonna here give you the basic, later on I'm gonna be more specific. What we do here is we make this observation that in passenger transportation markets, there's a trip back for each trip by the same person. And this, as I will show, has a lot of identification power. Just to illustrate this, this means that if riders of Lyft, if riders use Lyft to exit region I consistently less often than they use Lyft to enter region I, then Lyft, Lyft must have been quote unquote undersupplied in this region. Lyft's price and slash or wait time must have been high enough in order to lead the same people, the same population, who chooses Lyft over other options to enter the region, price and wait time must have been high enough in order to lead them to choose other options over Lyft to exit. And this conclusion, this sort of empirical inference, is stronger if the same gap between inflows and outflows is not present for other platforms, such as Uber, in the said region. So, Later, I'm going to tell you about the details of how we implement this. For now, let me just say we develop a method based on this and apply it to our data, and we find that indeed supply is more skewed towards denser areas. And indeed, it is a bigger issue for smaller platforms. So we do find evidence for economies of density and the role of market thickness in it. And something that I only will talk about if I have time, but is in the paper, we also show that supply is much more skewed uh, towards denser regions for taxi compared to ride sharing. That's on the empirical side. And um, 
very quickly about the implications for business strategy and public policy on the business strategy side, subject to the caveat that I'm going to talk about if I have time, we argue that there shouldn't be surge pricing for recurrent demand shocks, because for recurrent demand shocks, drivers know that there's going to be uh, a shock for demand in, the, in, in, a, in a region, and they would enjoy that anyway. But on top of that, the platform is offering economies of density to those drivers. And if anything, the platform could uh, could charge them, quote unquote, for that, uh, for the economies of density and reduce their wages a little bit and pass some of the reduced wage uh, to passengers in the form of reduced prices. Um, we also argue that there should be a bonus for long pickups. Some platforms have started doing that. They offer to drivers more to go and pick up a passenger that is far away. But we also argue that not all of the extra costs, not all of the extra wage that the driver should be passed on to passengers. And platforms should sort of foot some of this bill in order to sort of invest into building economies of density into the less dense regions. On the policy side, we argue that breaking up or downsizing rideshare platforms can disproportionately hurt outer regions, even to, so, sort of aside from the usual um, market power arguments for breaking up or, down, or downsizing, we should also think about the spatial effects that these actions could, could have. They could lead to a, a clustering of drivers in busier areas. And we also do this empirically, and we come up with a minimum required platform size for NYC proper in order to avoid uh, uh, spatial skew of supply at the expense of outer regions. And the number that, that we come up with is around 120,000 rides per day for NYC proper. Okay? So as far as the literature, we contribute to at least two strands of literature. On the transportation market side, there has been many papers looking at strategic drivers. They look at different aspects of it, for example, Lagos or also Buholz that I could have also listed here, look at intraday dynamics, Guda and Subramania look at the platform aspects of managing strategic drivers. Um, Leon and Van, uh, and Van Dreisen look at platform size. And what we do is to contribute to this literature is to look at the effect of economies of density and the role of market thickness. And the main technical way that we do this, which I'm gonna be specific about later, is that we assume each region has a size rather than being a point, okay? And another strand of the literature that we look at and contribute to is the literature on empirically estimating spatial mismatch between supply and demand. And this literature has mostly focused on, on structural methods that require data on, uh, on vacant, uh, for example, if you look at it in terms of the transportation markets, require data on vacant calls. What we do is we offer a method that has a simple implementation, has limited data requirements, uh, and and applies, I would say, fairly general. Okay, so that's what we do. Now I can get into the details of the model, but before that, I can stop and see if there are any questions. No questions. No questions. Okay. Okay, I can start with the model. Let me jump right in. There are i greater than or equal to two regions. Each region is a circle with size Ti, and price of a right in region I is Pi, driver wage is denoted Ci. Each region I has a demand arrival rate of lambda I, which is a function of Pi, given by lambda bar I, this is the potential demand, multiplied by a fraction F, which is a decreasing function of Pi. And when a demand arrival happens, the uniform, the location of it is going to be uniformly distributed on the circumference of the circle that the region is. Without loss of generality, we assume that regions are uh, sorted in a descending way according to their densities of potential demand, lambda bar i divided by Ti. There is a mass of total capital and drivers playing a simultaneous game in the setup where each driver chooses a region i to operate in, maximizing total revenue per hour. And the total revenue per hour is given by wage per right, Ci, multiplied by the frequency of the rides that the driver gives. And you could think of it as one divided by the wait time between rides. And the wait time between rides is denoted WI of NI, where NI is the total number of drivers present in the, in the region. And this total wait time has two components, idle time and pickup time. Idle time is the time it takes until you get assigned to a request 
and pickup time is the time it takes until um, you drive to the pickup location. All right. Um, idle time is increasing in the number of drivers in the region. The more drivers are there in the region with you, uh, the more you have to wait to be assigned a request. On the other hand, pickup time is decreasing in the number of drivers in the region. In that sense, the more drivers are there in the region with you, the less likely you are to be asked to do a pickup that is very far away from you. This is a sort of externality that could lead to economies of density and plays a role in a lot of the results that we have in the market. Another definition, rights per hour in this market is given by NI, divide, NI the total number of drivers multiplied by the frequency of rides they get, which is NI divided by the wait time. And we define this concept called access to rides in region I as the to total number of rides per hour divided by potential demand per hour. And obviously access is going to be between zero and one. Okay. And subsets access says how many of like what percentage of the potential demand gets fulfilled. So this is a basic set. All right. And let me define equilibria and we can then start thinking about the results. An equilibrium allocation of drivers n1 star through an i star is an allocation under which no driver in any region i has the incentive to relocate to choose a different region operate in a different region and strictly improve her revenue per hour okay and there are multiple equilibria but all of these multiple equilibria are ordered by by, by uh, dominance relationships and we pick the pareto optimal uh, equilibrium the equilibrium that Pareto dominates all the equilibria. So that's our selection rule. And in this talk, whenever I say the equilibrium, I mean the, the highest profitable uh, equilibrium for drivers. So now that we have all the definitions, we can think about the results. And let me sort of overview the results for you before I get into the detail. So, Hel, uh, just a quick question. Absolutely. All right. Uh, so when you talk about uh, equilibrium and dominant, Pareto dominant, is it also Pareto dominant for the platform? Mm, no. So, I mean, I guess the, the thing is that the platform can set prices and wages and then see what happens. And among the things that could happen, namely in terms of the interactions among the drivers, I just assume they do overall the one that is best for them. But the platform does have some wheel room later on, and I'm going to actually talk about it in this very slide. So our results are, we sort of categorize them into sort of two, two different groups. And the first step, what we do is we fix platform behavior, then we, we fix prices and wages in all of the regions, and we analyze driver equilibria. And we have two results. And by the way, the proposition numbers here are different from those in the paper because I'm skipping some of the results in the paper for the talk. So the numbers do not necessarily match up with the manuscript. Um, so proposition one says the equilibrium supply is skewed towards denser regions basically economies of density, all right? So that's what proposition one says. And the proposition, like, like the second proposition, is about the effect of market thickness. It says economies of density is more pronounced for smaller platforms. And we the gap between, uh, uh, the gap between how denser and less dense regions are served is bigger for smaller platforms. And the second set of our results are when we take a step back and now, ask, OK, what is optimal for the platform? And we allow the platform to set prices and wages uh, in different regions before the, the equilibrium uh, driver game takes place. And we have three results, two partial equilibrium results, in one of which we fix the prices and only allow the platform to set wages, and the other we do it the other way around. And finally, we make everything endogenous. So this is the set of our results that we're going to be talking about. I'm going to get started with the first proposition which says at the equilibrium, access to rights is higher in denser regions. So, and by the way, remember that here we are fixing platform behavior at uniform prices P and C, uniform prices P and wages C across regions. So this result says that if you look at two regions, I and J, where region I has a higher density of potential demand than region J, then in the equilibrium, region I gets more supply even after normalizing by its higher demand. That's economies of density. The second result is about platform size. You want to sort of talk about the idea that this could be a bigger issue for Lyft than for Uber or for Via than for Lyft. And for that, we need a definition of market thickness, which is the academic version of platform size. 
Recall that the market primitives are the vector of lambda bar, potential demand values in different regions, and the total number of drivers, and T, the, uh, size of the, the vector of sizes of all regions. You can think of two ways of changing the size of the platform, two ways of thickening the market. One would be a two-sided thickening, in which you multiply both demand and supply by the same factor greater than one. And the second one would be a one-sided thickening in which you only scale up the supply. And the second proposition that we have is that no matter which one of these two you do, by the way, remember that thickening the market or making it thinner will preserve all of the demand ratio between any two regions. And our proposition shows that even though all of the demand ratios are preserved, making the market thicker is going to make the supply more balanced. Or in other words, making the market thinner, making the platform smaller in a way that you preserve all of the de demand ratios between regions is going to skew the supply ratios towards denser regions. OK, so that is the effect of market thickness. Um, and the proof, I'm going to skip both the proof and the intuition behind it. Let me just say it is based on strong induction in the number of in the number of regions. And uh, offline, I'll be happy to talk about what challenges arise in trying to prove this and how we and how we get around them. Um, in the second step, as I said, we ask about what is optimal for platform. So before I tell you about what the platform actually does, let me briefly tell you a little bit about what the platform thinks and not just think, and not thinking yet yet about what it does. There's a proposition, the formal version of which is in the paper, which says the platform optimal allocation involves some spatial uh, skew between supply and demand, but less than what the driver location choice equilibrium exhibits. Namely, if you ask the platform what is opt what allocation of drivers across regions is optimal for you, the platform would choose something that is some somewhat skewed, but not as much as the equilibrium. This is informative, but this is not about platforms action because the platform saying what it likes is not necessarily an indicative of whether or not the platform would take costly actions of changing prices and wages in order to go ahead and reduce the skewness. And that's what we want to look at next. And in order to do so, we need to make at least one change in the model. We need to make N the number of drivers endogenous because we are making wages endogenous. The moment you make wages endogenous, you have to have like a reservation wage and then make the number of drivers endogenous and have the equilibrium be at a, uh, at a number of drivers and that makes drivers indifferent between being in the market and not. And for some of our specifications, we're going to assume a linear functional form for the uh, demand uh, fraction function. All right, so let's start with the, with the results. Um, and I'm going to start with two partial equilibrium results because they sort of point to opposing forces. And then the main result is going to sort of uh, tell us which force is strong. First, I'm going to fix the prices across all of the regions at uniform values P and allow the platform to choose different wages for different regions and see what happens. Our proposition says the platform is going to try and incentivize drivers to drive in less dense regions by offering higher wages to those who drive in those regions. Nevertheless, the platform is not going to fully eliminate the imbalance. Even after the platform optimally decides wages and encourages drivers to go to less dense regions, even then in the equilibrium, we will see that higher demand density regions get more supply even after normalizing by their higher demand. And then the second part of the proposition again goes back to the effect of market thickness and shows that this is even under platform uh, intervention in terms of wages, we will still have the same result as we had before, which is smaller platforms will see more skew of supply relative to demand. Um, the second proposition do it the, does it the other way around. It fixes wages and looks at optimal prices, and it shows that optimally the platform will give lower prices to driver to, to sorry to passengers in less dense regions in order to boost the demand and again build economies of density and fight the skew. But again, it's only going to mitigate it optimally and not eliminate it. Um, and the intuition is as I said before, the platform does like some skew because the platform also doesn't want its drivers' time wasted in doing long pickups. But also the platform uh, uh, internalizes the externalities that the drivers do not internalize. When a driver decides to not operate in a less dense region, 
the driver makes that region even more sparse. And that matters to the platform, but not to the driver. And that is why the platform tries to give them to sort of make the distribution a little less skewed. Okay, so these proposition, I want to sort of make this point that they lead to economic forces that go against each other. When you fix the wages, the platform, as I said, lowers the prices in sparser regions in order to incentivize drivers to drive in those regions. But if wages can respond to that, then maybe the platform would also want to lower wages in those regions because those are now the regions in which the platform makes less money off of each passenger. And so now maybe there's less incentive to sort of take your drivers. On the other hand, when the, when the platform fixes the prices, as I said in one of the proposition, the platform increases the wages in sparser regions in order to increase density by sending drivers there. But if prices could respond to that, then the platform, there, there will be some sort of double marginalization, right? The platform would want to pass on some of this extra wage to passengers. So you see one of these partial equilibrium propositions said increase the wages in, uh, in, and, and, and consequently, potentially, the prices in less dense regions. The other one says decrease both. And the question now is which force is stronger? Which is going to be the way the platform is going to try to build economies of density into less dense regions? By, is it going to be by decreasing the wages and decreasing the prices a little bit or by increasing them? And our main proposition says that it's the wage force that is the winner, namely, when plat the platform can both optimally choose it, optimally choose prices and wages at the same time, it is going to give higher wages to drivers in less dense regions, and in response to that, increase the prices to passengers in those regions a little bit. However, the other force, even though it loses out in this sort of clash of economic forces, it has some bite here. It turns out that the pass through is less than one, namely you give drivers a higher wage in less dense regions, say $2, but you don't charge right, you don't charge passengers $2 more. You charge passengers maybe only $1 more. So you sort of foot part of this bill, okay? So that's the, that's the insight. And again, there's still going to be some imbalance in the equilibrium. The platform will mitigate, but not fully eliminate the, uh, uh, the imbalance of the market. And again, we have the same effect of market thickness. This is gonna be a, more pronounced uh, observation in, 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 in smaller platforms for thinner markets. So that is a theoretical side of the analysis. I guess I have um, a little more than 15 minutes. I can stop here for questions. If there are no questions, I can go to the empirical analysis. So All right. Okay, thank you, Benita. Um, okay, so for the empirical analysis, we use data, wide level data with uh, origin and destination and time from Uber, Lyft, and Via from mid 2017 until late 2019 in NYC proper. Unfortunately, we don't have the suburbs, but we have all the five boroughs. Um, and the objective that we have here is to test the two implications of the model. We first want to test for economies of density, namely the idea that regions with higher density for potential demand also have higher access to rights, namely higher number of rides, even after normalization by their higher demand. So that's economies of density that we want to test for. And second, the role of market thickness, namely the idea that economies of density is more, is more pronounced for smaller platforms, for thinner markets. As I mentioned before, this is challenging. And the challenge is that this lambda I bar, the potential demand, is unobserved in both of these quantities. So you don't really see, if you see like say low activity in a region, namely a low number of rights per say square mile, you can't really tell how much of it is because of low demand density and how much of it is because of that demand is not properly served. And that's what we want to speak to here or we want to proxy here. And as I mentioned before, our solution is based on relative outflows, the number of outgoing rides divided by the number of incoming rides, okay? To illustrate again, if the outflow of platform K's rides from region I is consistently much lower than the inflow, then, then to us that is a sign of lower access to, 
right with K in region I due to price and slash or wait time being relatively higher. Again, this is because the same population that chooses K over other options to enter on the average systematically is more likely to choose uh, other options over K to exit, okay? And this conclusion, this sort of empirical inference is stronger if the same gap does not exist for other platforms in the same region or for the same platform in uh, observably similar regions that as I will discuss later. All right, so before detailing the how we do the analysis, let me just show you some visual data patterns about these uh, quantities relative outflow, the number of outgoing rides divided by the number of incoming rides. I want to emphasize two things which exactly go along with the theoretical results that we have on economies of density and um, and also are in line with what we want to test. The first thing is that relative outflows are always higher in denser areas. And the second is that the gap between relative outflows of dense and less dense areas is bigger for smaller platforms, both if you look cross-sectionally and if you look over time. For example, let's look at this graph over here. We have relative outflows, again, the number of outgoing rights divided by the number of incoming rights for each of the platforms, Uber, Lyft, and Via, uh, in, in NYC proper in the five boroughs, Manhattan, Queens, let me actually move my cursor, Manhattan, Bronx, Queens, uh, Brooklyn, and Staten Island. Um, we have it for we have it for every month, but I'm plotting here just July 2017 and July 2018. And I wanted to sort of emphasize two patterns. First, the relative outflow is always the highest in Manhattan and decreases as you move towards the outer regions. Namely, in Manhattan, there are more people taking rights outside of Manhattan, like outgoing from Manhattan compared to those uh, that take rights into Manhattan. But for example, if you look at Staten Island, a large number of people who take lift rights to go into Staten Island choose other options to leave. So first of all, as I said, you see that the relative outflow is highest in Manhattan and decreases as you move outward. And second, the gap between relative outflows of Manhattan and the outer regions is wider for smaller platforms. This is visible both if you look cross-sectionally, smaller platforms have more colorful plots here, and also if you look over time, as Lyft grows in size, the relative outflow distribution becomes more balanced. So this is the kind of thing, and by the way, this is not an artifact of looking only at five regions. If you look sort of more, uh, in a, more finely using uh, 200 something, I believe, zones, you get very similar results. So now let's formalize this a little bit. As I mentioned before, we want to test for economies of density. We want to test whether regions with higher potential demand density get higher access to supply. Namely, they get higher amount of supply even after normalizing by their demand. The ideal test, which is impossible, would be to test directly whether there's a positive association between AI, access in region I, and DI, uh, demand density in region I. But again, if you, uh, as I mentioned before, these two are unobserved because potential demand is unobserved. But let's try to proxy a test that, let's try to de de devise a test that is a good proxy for this in our view. Look, this, this positive association would be very counterintuitive if it weren't for economies of density because potential demand is in the numerator of density, but in the denominator of access to rights. It's only because of economies of density that we get higher access to right, higher, yeah, higher access for higher density, because it means you get supply that is higher even after normalizing by this demand. So we have a test that goes like this. We look at relative outflows, the number of outgoing rights divided by the number of incoming rights, because there is this flavor of potential demand in the number of incoming rights. Those who come in must have gone out either shortly after or shortly before, okay? And for density, we look at density of incoming rights. So again, we have the same quantity, incoming rights in the numerator here and denominator here. If it weren't for economies of density, you wouldn't necessarily expect a positive association here. But economies of density tells you one way for which there would be more drop, for, for regions with more drop-offs per square mile, you would expect more pickups per drop-off, okay? And that's what we want to test. We want to formalize this test of an association between relative outflows and uh, and density of inflows. And we simply regress the log of relative outflow 
in region I platform K duration D, we regress it over the log of the uh, inflow of rights. And our hypothesis is simply the idea that the coefficient is positive. And it turns out that it is indeed positive and significant, no matter what fixed effect specification you use, if you use none, if you use borrow fixed effects, if you use platform fixed effects, zone type fixed effect. By zone type, I mean commercial, residential, park. There was another one, I think manufacturing, something like that. Or even if you in sort of interact all of these uh, fixed effects, you will still get the result that this effect is po always positive and significant, uh, which is in line with the economies of density hypothesis that we had. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip this identification argument. Happy to talk about it offline. I'm also going to skip the second result, but just very briefly tell you that according to our theory, you would expect some diminishing return to the density for a region. And you would expect the second sort of the second order coefficient to be negative, and it turns out that it indeed is. But I'm going to skip the details of it. We also look at the role of market thickness. We expect the gap to, between the access values for high and low density regions to be wider for smaller platforms, right? And here's the way we operationalize this. We regress relative outflows on borough population density, um, platform size, and their interaction, importantly. And we expect the interaction coefficient to be negative. This is because an interaction coefficient that is negative says that if the platform becomes larger, then the gap between the relative outflows of higher and lower density regions is going to decrease. And that's sort of the what we would expect for, for, for higher economies of density for smaller platforms, all right? And we take this regression, again, with a number of possible fixed effect specifications. Um, and as you see, the effect is always negative and significant. Again, if you have no fixed effect, if you have platform fixed effect, year, month, borrow fixed effect, even more nuanced fixed effects, interacting all of these, the result is fully robust. And I'm not showing it here, but it's also robust to functional form specifications. Um, so let me... Sorry for the interruptions. You have five minutes. Thank you. Um, so let me mention one thing here, and that is the tests that we uh, carried out, tests for economies of density, but they do not necessarily test for economies of density coming from strategic driver behavior. The economies of density could be explained perhaps even solely by on the writer side, even though that could still have some of the, like perhaps most of the implications that we have in the model, I think we are still interested in figuring out how much of it is from the driver side, namely from the mechanism that our theoretical model posits. Here I'm showing you one piece of anecdotal evidence, but there is more you can find online, where, where it says people do avoid outer regions because the pickups are farther away, and they believe it's a more pronounced problem for Lyft than it is for Uber, okay? Another piece that we, that we don't have in this talk, and we currently don't have in the paper, but we are adding to a revision of this paper, is an empirical analysis of individual level driver panel data from Wright Austin, which is a platform in the city of Austin, and shows that drivers indeed are sensitive to pickup times and pickup times play an important role in their decisions to, to, to turn off their apps and leave an area, okay? But we don't have it for this paper, for, for, this, uh, for this version of the paper, which means our test so far only test for economies of density, but not necessarily economies of density through strategic driver behavior. All right, so let me talk about implications of the analysis for business strategy and public policy. For business strategy, um, as I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, we say search pricing for uh, recurrent versus short-run demand shocks should be different from each other. For short-run demand shocks, you want to get the drivers there. For recurrent, to the extent that they have learned about the recurrent uh, surge of demand in a region, if anything, you are providing them with, you're as a platform, you're providing them with uh, economies of density, which they enjoy, for which you can charge them, and sort of also pass on some of, by, by charging them, I mean, reduce their wages, and sort of pass on some of this wage reduction to passengers in the form of price reduction. And the second implication is uh, pickup time bonus. Platforms should, and some of them have started giving pickup time bonus, giving more, uh, giving a higher wage to drivers to do long pickups. And here we add, you should avoid charging passengers the full bonus paid to the driver. 
you should pay part of that as a platform and you should see it uh, as uh, as an investment into building economies of density into those less dense regions. Because if you get drivers there, it's going to become a little less sparse, which means next drivers are going to be willing to go there without you giving them bonus because now pickup times are slightly shorter. All right. On the public policy side of the implications, as I mentioned before, theoretically, there's this idea that breaking up or downsizing rideshare platforms, which the, in terms of the downsizing, it has been uh, a big discussion in the city of New York. In addition to the potential, um, in, in addition to the sort of traditional market power implications, another implication to be mindful of here is the potential distortion of, uh, of supply of drivers towards denser regions, which you want to be mindful of when you do this, uh, when you're thinking about uh, doing this regulation, uh, which could hurt uh, the, these outer areas. And we also do it empirically. We just look at the regressions that I showed you before from the impact of platform size on the distribution of relative outflows. And we enter this term, enter the sort of diminishing sensitivity term, the satiation term, A max, and we make the model uh, to represent the idea that once the size hits above A max, then the size doesn't have a role anymore in shaping the distribution of relative outflow. And this A max value we estimate through nonlinear release squares. And the result came back around 3.5 million bytes per month, which translates to 120,000 uh, rights per day for, N for NYC proper, which is the size that Lyft reached, I think in late 2018, Uber was there before and Via is nowhere near that, okay? This I'm going to sort of breeze through and almost skip, but if you do the same analysis that we did for rideshare, if you do that for taxi, it turns out that taxis are much more clustered in busier regions. And it's it's like the evidence for economies of density is much more salient for taxis than it is for rideshare. So let me briefly conclude. Uh, what we do is we look at economies of density. Um, we show that it leads to agglomeration of drivers in denser regions. We show that the platform would not like it, even though it would like some of it, would not like it as much as it arises among drivers naturally. So it would take corrective actions using, drive, using prices and wages in order to mitigate, but not eliminate it. We show that it is a bigger issue for smaller platforms. We showed that it's, we talked about its implications for search pricing and public policy and, uh, and pickup time bonuses and we mentioned that it's, it, it is a first order relevance, not only to ride share, but also to taxi cabs. Um, and for future research, you could think of theory and empirical avenues on the theory side. You could also think about platform competition, namely think about what would happen to the impacts of economies of density if you also added uh, a competition element. And on the empirical side, I think an interesting question would be sort of empirically quantify the optimal spatial pricing policy. When we say the platform should give higher wages in less than three regions and also accompany it with slightly higher prices, these are qualitative coming out of theory analysis. One question would be look at a specific market and tell us how much exactly that extra wage for these regions and, and the, the accompanying extra price in those regions are going to be. I think that's an empirical and interesting question that could follow up from this research. And that is all I have. Thank you. And I stopped sharing. So Pender, you can, can share screen. All right, I think uh, you guys should be able to see my screen now. Yes. Okay, um, so let me start. Uh, uh, nice paper, I mean, I really enjoyed uh, reading the paper, right? Uh, it's one of those papers where after you read it, uh, you wish you had thought of uh, some of the things that they have done. So. Uh, so I want to say that up front. I mean, really nice paper. I enjoyed reading it and uh, a lot of uh, clever things that happen in the paper. Uh, in the time that I have, I just want to point out a few key things that I thought uh, might be useful for the audience as well as uh, for the authors, right? And so um, VK2.0 is, I think, just a joke between me and uh, Vineet. Uh, you can ask him what it is. Okay, so. Um, so 
in a nutshell, what this uh, paper is about is something like this. So let's say you're thinking about uh, how drivers allocate between two equally sized uh, territories. And what you have is information about demand. Uh, territory one has 10 units of demand, territory two has uh, six units of demand. Um, and let's say there are eight drivers altogether. Um, an obvious uh, uh, um, uh, strategy might be to report uh, proportional to demand, right? So you could put five drivers in territory one, three drivers in uh, territory two. Um, that's directly in proportional to the demand. So that's uh, essentially what um, uh, the authors start off by saying, is it proportional to demand density? Uh, but what they basically argue and then show and carefully uh, test later on in the paper is that uh, actually uh, that's not how drivers would distribute because of the fact that uh, in territory two, uh, given that it's the same size as territory one, three drivers are going to face a longer time to pick up uh, customers on average, right? And so that means they have to work harder. They have to work the territory harder, which then means that that territory is that much less attractive uh, compared to territory one. And then if you think about uh, uh, drivers being strategic and profit maximizing, uh, they would prefer to be uh, on the margin um, in territory one than territory two, right? And then they show that uh, depending on how uh, uh, extreme this effect is, uh, uh, you could even have uh, no drivers in territory two. All three drivers in territory one, territory two might actually prefer to be in territory one. So uh, you get a disproportionate uh, allocation of uh, uh, drivers. Um, in terms of the demand density. That, that, that in a nutshell is kind of the core uh, phenomenon um, that the authors want to highlight, and then they try to uh, develop why that is important to know, and so on and so forth. And that kind of got reminded me of the example I use in class uh, when I uh, talk about Salesforce allocation. So I have this example to motivate some discussion in my class, saying that let's say you just joined your company, your boss wants to know how to allocate salespeople, and um, so you have two territories, uh, currently, the sales force are allocated in some particular manner, and your boss is thinking, uh, why not allocate them proportional to territory revenue? Right? And then I ask the students, is that sensible, not sensible? Uh, majority of them says that, yes, that makes sense, right? Because uh, if, if uh, revenue per salesperson is higher in territory two and territory, than in territory one, then maybe you should shift more people from territory one to uh, territory two. Uh, and then a few of them who think about it a little bit more uh, then say that, well, Maybe uh, uh, people in Territory 1 have to work harder, right? Because maybe Territory 1 is bigger, in which case they have to work harder, so they need to have smaller quotas. So, so these kind of things, I think, are very relevant from a managerial perspective. Uh, now, of course, in a Salesforce uh, allocation uh, uh, context, there are other issues that come about, uh, some of which we'll talk a little bit later. But if you kind of zoom out and think about uh, from that perspective, right? If you think about uh, traditionally in marketing, we think about uh, Salesforce uh, territory allocation, that's something that's centrally done by the firm. The firm can decide how many to, uh, people to allocate to different territories. Uh, in, in this context, you have these uh, decentralized decision making, right? Every driver individually is deciding where they want to position themselves, right? So uh, a classic context, even before rideshare, could be thinking about uh, taxi cab, uh, how, how do they position themselves? They pick up customers, they drop, and after they drop customers, they wait for more fares at some point, right? And so. This has been studied uh, um, before formally modeling it as a, a dynamic game between uh, drivers. And what I mean by a game is that every driver is thinking about the fact that uh, they face some competition from uh, other drivers who are uh, close by. Uh, at the same time, there's also some spatial friction. That is that if they have to move from one location to another location, uh, that is effortful, costly, time consuming and all that. And sort of a core uh, 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 takeaway from that paper uh, is there's a uh, inefficiency that happens in this decentralized uh, market, which is that there's a spatial mismatch between uh, supply and demand. Uh, and then uh, uh, you're coming to the right share context, you can think about, okay, with de decentralized workers, right? Because in the gig economy, in Uber, uh, uh, there's this whole debate that uh, uh, all the workers are part-time, which means that Uber doesn't directly control these workers. So the workers are making these decentralized decisions, but the platform can still intervene and implement some mechanisms. It could be through the surge prices or the region-wise prices that they are setting. Uh, it could be the wages they are offering, the bonuses they are offering. Uh, this too has been studied, and here I'll uh, shamelessly promote my own paper, uh, but this was the first paper to look at this idea that uh, uh, drivers uh, are deciding how to locate themselves between locations. Uh, they are facing some cost to move, the competition between themselves, and then the platform 
can then uh, uh, intervene, right? And so one of the uh, results in that paper is that the platform may rationally distort prices across regions. Why is that happening? Because they're trying to uh, internalize some of the externalities that the drivers are ignoring and trying to maximize profit across zones. And what this paper comes and talks about, and, and so that's what I mean by saying, I wish I had thought of it, right? Because I had, I, the, the, this is a question that uh, I had been looking at for some time, but what is new in this paper is that uh, uh, they introduce this idea that uh, there's an, another kind of externality that's not been looked at before um, that comes about because uh, drivers are behaving strategically. Uh, and, and that is that uh, when you think of a region uh, being an actual space, not a point, then there's also an externality in terms of pickup time. So what, what that means is that uh, in a particular region, holding that region constant, as more and more drivers come in, yes, drivers face more competition from other drivers, but also uh, the time that they will spend to pick up a ride is going down, right? So th there are these two competing effects. What the previous papers uh, looked at predominantly is the first effect, which is as there are more drivers in a location, uh, the driver is facing more competition. Uh, but this paper says that the second aspect, the pickup time, uh, that is also there, and that has some important implications, right? And so the key result that uh, they develop and then they show under different settings uh, and then finally test with the data is uh, the driver density is not proportional to the demand density. It is going to be skewed towards the uh, higher demand density. And the basic reason is coming from the fact that uh, a, a region with lower demand density is more costly to serve. So that's the basic idea. If it's more costly to serve, then uh, you're going to attract uh, fewer drivers uh, to that particular market. So uh, quick comments on the uh, theory portion. Uh, I think it's a really clever idea. The model is really carefully thought to deliver this key result in a very, very clear way, in a convincing way. Um, it's You can think of it as an entry model. You have uh, N different markets and then M uh, drivers, and each of these drivers are trying to decide which of these markets to enter. So that's kind of how they model. Um, so they're abstracting away from some of the uh, details that uh, uh, come up in um, this particular market in terms of, uh, okay, drivers could be moving between locations or there are some intraday dynamics in demand. So that's not the topic of this paper. This paper really focuses on trying to look at uh, this relationship between demand density and driver density and um, showing that there's a skewness that develops there, right? And so uh, the paper is uh, really well developed in that way. Um, and I think if they can make the connection clearer to the previous literature, it will actually help them bring out that that's the key uh, strength of this paper, right? So that makes the, uh, um, I think, clearer for the reader what's the uh, crucial insight that's coming from here. Uh, now, a couple of things, uh, as I read, uh, these are more things that maybe they can easily clarify. Uh, some of them they actually clarified in the talk. Uh, you can ask, why is the proportional allocation the benchmark? As I said, when I asked this question in my class, uh, that's what the lay intuition is, right? And so, so that may be one reason, or maybe there is some literature that actually thinks about, oh, you must have equal access. Uh, my understanding is if you solve for the social plan is optimum, that will also be skewed towards higher density just because that's what the economies of density means. Uh, it means that if you have lower demand density, then that region is more costly to serve, which means that even a social planner would put fewer drivers uh, to that particular market. Uh, the market thinning result, uh, uh, I think Sohel mentioned, um, uh, yes, there's a usual idea that uh, uh, there are some economies and so uh, platforms, especially two-sided markets, if you uh, make them smaller, uh, that can um, have some negative effects, but they kind of elaborate that, I think, one step further by saying, uh, there's also this imbalance aspect of it. Not, not only is there going to be a general loss because of the usual two-sided effects, but also the imbalance between high-dense and low-dense uh, uh, demand areas is going to be even more um, uh, amplified. Um, and I think if you think about uh, breaking up a business into competing businesses, there's an additional effect that would come. Uh, if you had competing uh, ride-share businesses, a potential positive effect is on the pricing side. Uh, that may be something that's interesting to uh, look at further, right? So if you if you want to analyze a, a policy of uh, breaking up a monopoly into competing uh, providers. Um, here, in the interest of time, let me just uh, focus on a few key things. I think uh, um, the authors did mention something about targeted wages, targeted prices. The code inefficiency in the model is coming from the uh, drivers not internalizing these pickup times. And uh, the more direct instrument uh, to target that would be to uh, expose, right? Once the driver is matched with a customer, 
then pay them a wage depending on how much they actually have to drive. Right now, it's an ex-ante uh, incentive that is uh, uh, the wage that is given to the driver. But you could make it a more targeted instrument, and Uber has the technology to implement it. Also, Uber can actually target customers with specific prices. If a customer has no uh, driver close by, then that customer is going to pay a surge price, whereas the other customer who has uh, a drivers uh, uh, nearby is not going to pay a higher price. Uh, I don't think this is going to fundamentally change the insights of the model, but just to, uh, I think from a platform point of view, uh, these are interesting. I also think that uh, they're focused on one, they've really kept all other factors equal, right? Uh, but I think any other differences that comes about between regions, that's also going to contribute to the skew. Uh, maybe that's something to add uh, just so that uh, the theoretical results are a little bit more complete from that uh, point of view. Uh, also, uh, talking about, I think one other point, uh, which I'll come back to the, uh, come back to it when I talk about the empirical side, is that uh, another uh, driver density effect would be as there are more drivers, the pickup time goes down. But as the pickup time goes down, customer demand uh, would also increase. Right? So there's a demand side response um, that would also be interesting to model. So again, I think that's going to reinforce the results. But when you think about policy uh, implications, that might be interesting to uh, take into account also. Now, in I think I have one or two minutes, so let me just quickly uh, uh, talk about the empirical section. My uh, key thoughts, uh, I think the authors uh, motivate from the beginning that it's really going to be challenging to uh, test in the data. Initially, when I was reading the introduction, I wasn't sure what they were hinting. Finally, when I come to the empirical section, I think it becomes more clearer. The basic problem is that the constructs that they have in the theory model, uh, they are not directly observed in the data. What is observable is right inflows and uh, right outflows between uh, regions. Now, they develop a proxy test. Uh, long story short, what it basically tests is whether regions with more incoming ride per square mile, which means that there must be more drivers who are now available after dropping off these incoming rides, uh, that must be uh, correlated with, uh, uh, positively correlated with outgoing ride per incoming ride. That's what their relative uh, uh, outflow uh, measure was. Um, I mean, th th there's a lot of good arguments in the paper. Uh, my final thoughts on that is uh, what the regression results clearly support is maybe a more direct demand effect, right? not so much a strategic driver effect, right? because what they are basically showing is that higher incoming ride per square mile leads to higher outgoing ride per incoming ride. So if you have more incoming rides, there are more drivers, which means that region will not have surge prices. Customers will be happier because they get drivers more easily. So customers are making more demand requests. So the demand side is going up because of this. And then correspondingly, you have more outgoing ride per incoming ride. Uh, my main point is this is um, more a direct effect. It's not so much as a direct effect of uh, the um, driver density as opposed to working, th working its way through the strategic driver behavior, which is what the core uh, testable prediction of the uh, model is. So I think of it more as a test of the primitive uh, for the model in terms of some of the economies that come from density. Um, and what the authors have said is they actually plan to look at a new data set where they can actually directly test the driver's strategic behavior as well. Uh, and I think that's uh, very good. Uh, now, but prior to talking to the authors, I was also thinking that if, that's, if, if this is the data that they are observing, then uh, maybe they should directly model the constructs that they are observing. Right? So the current theory model has no inflow outflow, whereas the empirical test is based only on inflow and outflow. Um, and, and then a lot of uh, questions come up. Uh, you don't observe platform dynamic prices, the bonuses. Uh, also, outcome in every region is dependent on outcome in other regions. I just thought that uh, a different approach might be even if you can set up uh, a simpler model. Right? They have a theory model which has n locations, but maybe even if you can set up a model with two locations, three locations, where you can uh, show that with inflows, outflows, what kind of outcomes you might expect. That might give more confidence as well when you're using that type of data to test theory. And so with that, uh, as I said, uh, really enjoyed reading the paper, uh, really clever idea. Um, and I think um, um, the authors have a great idea on their hand. Thanks. Thank you so much, Upender. Upender, thank you very much for this comment. Sure. Romita, are you ready to go? Um, yes. Uh, 
So I'll try sharing my screen. Okay. Since that is a. Um, can everybody see my screen? Yes. OK, great. Um, yeah, just a second. I'm trying to see if I can. Oh, OK, I can transfer people. OK, so um, thank you for having me here. Um, I'm Bumija Ranjan. I'm here at Monash University in Australia, so big hi from down under. Um, this is a work that is done with uh, my colleagues at Brandeis University, Ben Schiller and C.C. Lu. Um, they're not here, uh, unfortunately, for the presentation. Um, ben was getting his COVID vaccine, so I think he's under the weather today. So, um, so if you have any questions, please uh, interrupt me while I'm speaking because I don't think I'll be able to um, look at the chat in real time. So uh, this uh, paper is about uh, uh, talking about uh, ratings format with a an application towards um, car safety and crash worthiness. So, um, sorry, I'm OK. So uh, basically the idea is that uh, we all know that ratings are used to convey quality information to customers. Uh, this is for a bunch of different kinds of categories and goods um, like experience goods uh, such as Airbnb or if you're thinking of buying a new car, then it could be for looking at how safe the car is. Uh, it's also for search goods. We basically use it ubiquitously and there are a whole bunch of papers uh, talking about how ratings impact both customers and firms. Um, the uh, topic that we are focusing on is how should ratings be uh, formatted? So there is a wide variety of how ratings exist today in the marketplace. So for instance, if you look at uh, Amazon uh, or uh, Airbnb, they're almost continuous. So you get a rating out of five, but the rating itself is like 4.6 or 4.89. Um, so it's almost near continuous. If you look at uh, IMDB, it's a rating out of 10, but again, uh, you are uh, seeing increments in um, steps of maybe 0.1. On the other hand, uh, Yelp or um, uh, for instance has ratings in steps of 0.5. And in our um, context, which is uh, cars, we see that um, car safety ratings organization have a very coarse uh, metric, which is uh, a badge, a safety badge that they provide, which is uh, saying this is the top safety pick for the year. Um, so there is a wide um, heterogeneity in the way ratings are formatted in the marketplace. And uh, so our, uh, so the, the, the question is about how should uh, ratings be formatted? So in a way, we, um, there, are, there are arguments both in favor for continuous ratings, uh, which is that uh, precise or uh, more, um, let's say, uh, smaller uh, uh, ratings in smaller increments are going to provide more information to consumers. Um, uh, this has been done in a couple of papers. Uh, in our context, the um, IIHS, which is the Car Safety Rating Agency, uh, awards a safety, uh, uh, has a very discrete uh, zero one badge system, and it provides this safety peg badge to about a third of the vehicles. And this badge, um, I, I'll come to show that this badge actually masks significant heterogeneity in safety features. Um, there are also, um, um, arguments in favor of discrete ratings. So discrete ratings, for instance, improve salience. Uh, they uh, probably also uh, improve on uh, how people perceive the ratings. So there are also a bunch of papers that talk about how discrete ratings are better. And in the end, this is a question of me mechanism design. There is There are also a um, bunch of papers in uh, the students grade literature, which talk about how uh, students grade should be provided. Should it be a, in a continuous uh, scale from zero to 100 or should you be providing uh, letter grades like A, B, C, D and so on? Um, the argument for continuous uh, 
the argument for discrete ratings uh, in the mechanism design literature is that uh, students that are close to the uh, boundary are going to exert more effort uh, so that they can, if they are at 89% and uh, the uh, A grade is provided at 90%, they're going to uh, put in a slightly more effort to go past and get that 90% effect. So uh, there are basically pros and cons from both ends. So we're going to be looking at the car safety uh, rating system and talk about what happens if we change the format of the safety ratings. So this is also an important context because um, car safety. Uh, so if you look at the top uh, causes of death across in the US, uh, it's the 11th leading cause of death. Um, there are about 33,000 deaths every year due to uh, car crashes. Uh, more than 4 million injuries and uh, I think one of the reports mentioned that at least as of 2010 uh, they cost about 242 billion dollars in economic costs annually. So uh, it's an important uh, topic to study from a public policy perspective um, and car safety ratings are um, are investigated by independent agencies. There are, uh, the agency we are going to look at is the IIHS, which is, an, uh, which is a kind of a non-profit agency that uh, does it on its own. There is a second uh, agency, uh, federal agency called the NHTSA, which also looks at car safety ratings. So, um, so manufacturers, uh, since uh, car safety features never re reveal themselves uh, until a really adverse event takes place, Manufacturers aren't really um, uh, encouraged uh, to uh, improve safety ratings on their own, which is why we need these independent agencies to provide uh, the safety um, badge or a safety rating of some kind so that they are um, incentivized to improve the safety features of their cars. Um, so the motivation for this paper is that uh, we want to ask the question, are course and safety ratings better or, or are they continue, are the continuous ones better? But we are going to look at it in terms of the co economic costs as well as uh, loss to life. Um, and then we are also, also looking at it from a counterfactual sense about how manufacturers are going to respond to a change in ratings format. So as all structural stuff, we are going to uh, the uh, key uh, innovation in this paper is that we are first going to estimate a, a univariate continuous safety rating uh, from a, a data set of um, car crashes using that univariate. Um, so you be, and secondly, we're going to uh, estimate a demand model for uh, car uh, features for uh, new car purchases and we're going to plug in this univariate safety uh, rating as a counterfactual and look at how it uh, uh, improves or uh, doesn't improve uh, uh, consumer surplus and um, downstream injuries or fatalities. So the um, uh, so what we're going to do is that we're going to uh, estimate the impact of providing cu uh, customers continuous measures of car uh, crash worthiness, how that affects both cons uh, consumers and manufacturers. Uh, this continuous measure is going to be constructed from actual performance of cars and car accidents in terms of both injuries and fatalities. Uh, so the idea is that if you look at this uh, flow chart, uh, when a person is uh, looking uh, to buy a new car. They are looking at uh, car characteristics that are provided by the manufacturer. Uh, they also look at safety ratings that are coming from uh, the uh, ratings organizations. Both these uh, jointly determine demand for the car and once uh, the demand system clears, uh, as people drive, um, there is a certain probability of getting into a car crash, which could lead to injuries or fatalities. Uh, so there, there is a problem of selection issue, which is uh, if people have positive preferences for safer cars, 
Uh, so if safer drivers are opting for safer cars, then some part of injuries or fatalities could also be explained by safer driving practices and not just the mechanical safety of the machine. So we're, we're going to talk about some of these issues as I go along. Um, so just a brief preview of results uh, in case I run out of time. What we find is that there is a positive preference for the badge uh, uh, when we look at the demand system, and this leads to customer sorting. So sa safer drivers do opt in for safer cars, uh, and that uh, um, customer sorting accounts to about uh, one eighth or 12.5 percent of the reduction in uh, driver fatalities. So it's not just that the car is safer, it's also that the driver is safe, uh, employs safer driving practices, and that uh, accounts for about an eighth of the reduction in driver fatalities. So if we take those um, cr continuous uh, crashworthiness measures that we construct, uh, and we say that uh, these are provided to the um, individuals or consumers uh, in the counterfactual, uh, we find that that actually leads to improved customer sorting. Um, it uh, corresponds to a further 5.2 to 7.4% reduction in driver fatalities. Um, so there is evidence that course ratings might actually obscure useful information from customers. Um, okay, so before I go into the background, uh, I'd like to stop and ask if there are any questions. Okay, all right, so I will move ahead. So um, just to give you a brief uh, background, uh, the IIHS, um, it is the Institute for Independent something. I'm sorry, I forgot the uh, whole acronym. Uh, so the IIHS is an independent rating agency and it started its crash test starting from 1995. Um, it started with a mod, uh, it designs different kinds of tests uh, for new cars. Um, they rate, uh, they basically buy um, new models of cars and uh, design different kinds of tests under laboratory conditions. So for instance, the uh, site test for the um, car, which is, which started from 2005, uh, for instance, the, uh, the tests how a car uh, responds when it is kind of T-boned, uh, like a full-on side crash happens. Uh, with uh, so the the stimuli are kept constant across cars to ensure uh, consistency. So uh, just for an example, if you look at the side test, uh, it's uh, basically looking um, when the impact velocity is about 60 kilometers an hour. It's coming full on at the car and what happens to the car. Um, and they measure, uh, for instance, I'm, I'm looking at one of the measures, which is called the B pillar test for the car. So how much does the car crush correspond, uh, corresponding to this level of force? So if it, for instance, crushes up to um, beyond the center line that is considered bad, uh, between zero to uh, five centimeter to the right of the center line from the driver's seat, that's considered uh, moderate. Um, between five and 12.4 centimeters, it's considered uh, good and beyond 12.5 centimeters, which impl implies that there is not much um, crushing, uh, which will lead to less injury. It's uh, considered good. So uh, basically, uh, the what the IHS does is that it uh, collects uh, 73 continuous measures uh, for different kinds of tests uh, for both uh, structural deformation of the car as well as injury measures that they um, do on a test dummy for head, neck, chest, knee, femur, so the main parts of the body that could lead to long-term damage or death. Um, in different uh, different um, kind of uh, accident conditions, such as uh, when there is a moderate overlap or a small overlap, there is uh, a full-on side crash, or if there is a rollover of the car and um, how strong the roof is. 
So for each of these different dimensions, they can construct, there are 73 total continuous measures um, and they provide four um, ratings for each um, uh, subcategory. So like um, you get a moderate overlap rating, a small overlap rating and so on. And based on the how the car uh, uh, performs in these four dimensions, they finally get uh, or don't get the IIHS badge. So if you go, if you're interested in buying a new car, so uh, in fact, this um, project started because um, uh, I was, uh, my co-author was looking at buying a new car and uh, we were talking about how the ratings uh, organizations work. So if you go on to the uh, IHS page and look for the 2021 Toyota Corolla, basically it says this is the top safety pick for the year. Um, so around a third of the cars every year get the top safety pick badge based on how they perform in these um, crash tests. And this is basically the prominent information that is uh, provided. There, uh, there's also like uh, the four discrete sub ratings that the race rating agency does provide, but um, they do not provide information on these uh, continuous measures. So, uh, so the, it, it, you can imagine a, a situation where two cars are performing nearly equal, but one gets the badge, but the other doesn't. And what we are uh, trying to say is, if you release the information for the car that does almost almost just as well, that is going to also affect the uh, customer preferences. Uh, so just a brief look at the data set. Um, so we have two sets of analysis that we are going to uh, conduct in this um, project. First is the um, crashworthiness of uh, uh, the car, which is the fatality rates, uh, which we are constructing using fatality rates uh, publicly available in the US and vehicle characteristics from the years 2005 to 2017. Uh, and the second part is going to be the demand estimation, uh, which we're going to uh, conduct with monthly market shares and vehicle characteristics for a subset of the years, which is from 2013 to 2017. We're also going to merge it in with uh, microdata uh, from uh, the CEX survey. Uh, so it looks at the joint demo, uh, distribution of demographics and vehicle choices. So uh, the uh, construction of this, um, the data for this uh, project comes from a variety of sources, uh, includes car sales characteristics, the crashes and fatalities that we got publicly from the NHTSA or the FAR system, uh, safety ratings that we scraped from IHS. We also added in some um, information about fuel economy, monthly incentives to just uh, make the data set richer. Um, so the big um, you know, data variation is about how the discrete sub ratings uh, improve over time. So if you look at the graph on the left, uh, when the IIHS introduces a new test, so like they introduced the uh, side crash uh, test in 2005, um, most cars did pretty badly. So this is just to show that car um, manufacturers actually respond to the incentives. The first year that they introduced the test, um, most cars did pretty badly. Uh, and as time went along, as they came to know that there is this test and that is actually hurting their safety score, um, they started improving on the structural integrity of the car to uh, go up. And now if you see most cars um, actually perform very well on the say, uh, side uh, test measure. So this is just to show that these rating agencies actually have an important role to play in uh, improving the quality of the cars that we drive. Uh, this is also um, so, but while these uh, re, uh, manufacturers exert effort to improve the quality of the car, uh, they uh, manage to do it just enough to get the good rating. So if you see there are uh, there's clumping at the threshold. So um, 
if you look if you look at uh, the x axis um, bigger numbers or as you move on to the right that is going to be uh, that is more collapse into the car which is bad um, so if you see you can see that there are um, you know uh, clumping at threshold so they basically uh, exert just enough effort to get a good rating and then stop beyond that so uh, the the it is also possible that these discrete sub ratings are um, you know uh, making people uh, making manufacturers exert exert slightly less effort but we also see that there is sufficient heterogeneity uh, that is present across different car manufacturers. Um, the second part of the data comes from the demand. Uh, for the demand estimation, we are using monthly sales by model, model year, and month. Uh, we uh, add in the safety measures, which is basically the discrete badge, whether it is um, uh, whether the car uh, receives it or not also uh, putting in car characteristics by model and model year and then there are time varying monthly prices uh, the time varying part is coming from fuel prices as well as monthly incentives that are provided to car dealerships and we're merging this with cu customer micro data so just to give you a brief sense of descriptive statistics uh, you can see that there is um, so we are looking at e years 2013 to 2017 so the model years that are um, uh, for new cars that were sold during this time extend from 2012 to 2018. Um, and there are about 250 model years, um, model, model years per uh, year. And uh, in uh, the first year, like in 2012, the IHS badge was actually quite uh, lenient the first two years. Nearly 50% of the cars got the IHS badge, and that has now reduced down to about 30% of the cars by the end of 2017-2018. Uh, um, and there are a bunch of car characteristics in terms of size, uh, miles per dollar, and so on. Okay, so I'm going to briefly go over the safety model uh, that we use for constructing the uh, continuous measure of uh, car safety. So what we do is that we are relating fatality crashes to car crash test measurements. So we are looking at actual performance of um, cars in fatal accidents in the US. Uh, the nice part is that the US has recorded uh, the outcome of every uh, crash that has happened since 1975. Uh, which re which leads to a death, to any death. It could be a pedestrian, it could be the person in the other car, um, it could be the driver themselves. So any death that happens in a car-related crash is measured in the US since 1975. We use this data set to construct um, what is the likelihood of a driver fatality uh, conditional on the car characteristics. So these characteristics include um, their physical dimensions as well as the um, continuous as well uh, continuous uh, measures uh, of performance in the car safety ratings uh, uh, tests done by the IHS. So uh, we are employing basically a kind of a binary logic structure you, uh, to construct these cars um, these crashworthiness rates. So every car, uh, depending on the number of cars available, every car has a probability of getting into a crash. Um, and then we are relating that probability with their ca car characteristics. Now there are two issues in, these, um, in this analysis. The first is that uh, since uh, fatal accidents occur after a person has com committed their purchase, um, therefore, uh, they have already exercised their choice of which kind of car they want to drive. So there is the selection issues um, present uh, due to the clearing of the demand system. So there is possible selection of cautious uh, drivers to save for related cars. So, um, so 
the idea over here we are employing is that uh, the continuous ratings uh, that the cars have in the 73 dimensions that IIHS um, measures. Uh, so it, cars that are just below the threshold of getting the badge versus cars that are just above the th threshold, uh, they should be uh, performing similarly in car crashes. So any differential um, in the uh, performance or fatality uh, rates of, of the of these two cars would only be due to the sorting of uh, drivers into uh, safer vehicles. So this is kind of um, similar to the um, regression discontinuity idea. So the important part over here is that we need to account for the selection or sorting by um, introducing a dummy or a, for the badge, which cars re receive the badge or not. Otherwise, we are going to uh, misidentify the slope of um, these uh, continuous measures. Uh, the second issue is uh, the uh, related to both uh, age and um, the um, time effects uh, of the accident. So for instance, if you compare the uh, 20, 10 model year with the 2014 model year. So let's say the 20, uh, this is just a hypo hypothetical example. So let's say the probability of death or a fatality in 2010 for a 2010 model year was 50%. Uh, it is all, it remains the same in 2014 uh, as 50%, but for the 2014 model year, it's about 25% in uh, 2014. So can we directly infer that uh, the 2014 model year is twice as safe as the 2010 model year. Um, the answer is we can't because it's possible that uh, the vehicle becomes half as a, uh, safe after aging four years, or there could be like road improvements that have uh, changed the situation between 2020, 2010 and 2014. So again, uh, it reduces the death rate by half. So we are to uh, um, take care of this issue. We are exploiting um, intermittent and staggered model redesigns. So we found that um, between redesigns, car safety, at least the IHS uh, deems it near identical. So for instance, if the car's uh, dimensions or uh, style hasn't changed, IHS actually does not um, conduct the safety ratings on the same uh, on the next model year. Uh, again, it actually uses the uh, safety ratings from the previous model year and just carries it on till there is a major redesign for the car. So if the 2010 and 2014 model years are structurally the same, they were ca getting the same uh, ratings from IHS, then we can identify the impact of age by comparing Uh, I'm sorry, I think you're muted. Sorry, can you uh, unmute yourself? Uh, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. Sorry, I have I been muted for all this time? No, 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 no. no. Okay, just, sorry. Just ten seconds. Yeah. Okay, all right, thank you. So. Uh, yeah, so uh, we can also impact, identify the impact of time. Uh, of uh, basically road imp uh, conditions improving uh, by comparing uh, the uh, fatality rates of the 2010 model year in 2010 with the 2014 model year in 2014. So basically, uh, we will be using age and time fixed effects uh, as well uh, to control for these uh, issues. So I'll jump into the crash analysis. Uh, so we uh, try to um, I mean, we conducted this crash analysis on about um, 100,000 crashes that uh, occurred across the US. Um, so if you look at uh, the main thing to take away over here uh, across specifications is that there is a significant effect of the safety badge. So this this the safety badge is actually uh, capturing the selection of safer drivers into safer cars um, and uh, 
this uh, effect remains um, after controlling for the continuous measures uh, in which um, the cars are tested by IHS. We also control for uh, the dimensions of the car, this board, uh, the style, whether it's a car or an SUV or a pickup, the weight of the car. Uh, we put in the age and time fixed effects that we talked about. And after throwing at pretty much everything that we had, the effect still remains uh, uh, about a negative 0.13, which corresponds to about a 12.5% um, reduction. So basic, uh, what we're what we're saying over here is that safer cars do lead to uh, less fatalities, but about 12.5% of that reduction in fatalities is actually explained by drivers selecting into safer cars. And this is an important result, uh, which has not been done yet in the literature. Uh, and we actually find the same effect whether we look at um, non-fatal crashes. So we find that there are um, drivers, uh, safer drivers actually employ um, be maybe uh, better maneuvers to, um, you know, to reduce the probability of getting a major injury or death conditional on being in a crash. Um, OK, so the so from this analysis, we actually construct a continuous safety score for the car based on how well they perf uh, how they actually perform on the road. Um, and we um, rescale it, renormalize it so that it is it is in the same scale as the discrete safety rating. So uh, we rescaled it such that uh, zero corresponds to the average safety of the non badge vehicle and one corresponds to the average safety of the badge vehicle. Um, and we'll be using these scores uh, for our counterfactual analysis. So um, moving on to the uh, demand model. So we're looking at upstream um, demand, uh, the, the upstream demand side model uh, when uh, consumers are uh, making the choice for buying a new car. Uh, we're going to follow a simple uh, BLP structure. Um, we're a utility framework with um, a car characteristics, which includes vehicle type, body style, dimensions, um, horsepower, and includes the safety badge. Uh, we are also going to uh, put in uh, a wide set of fixed effects to um, control for car age at the time of purchase, as well as, as month fixed effects, because um, at least within the year. So each uh, each unit of time is a single month. So within the year, uh, there is um, a high seasonality in when people purchase cars. So just to uh, control for that. And there is, of course, the classic BLP endogeneity term here. Um, in to to uh, estimate the price heterogeneity, we're going to follow a similar structure to BLP 1999, where the price coefficient is, uh, is scaled by income. And that is uh, the income information is uh, drawn from a log normal distribution. And uh, the estimation is by a GMM uh, following Petrin. So these are sta standard, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Um, OK, um, so let me jump right into the results of the demand estimation. The main thing to uh, uh, notice over here is that there is a an effect of um, the IHS badge uh, for certain segments of the population, uh, especially for the educated as well as um, so there is a um, higher preference for safer cars amongst uh, educated uh, segment as well as lower preference for um, the IHS badge uh, amongst the rural segment. Uh, the, we have also uh, constructed um, um, interactions between rural and car size, which is positive. So basically things are looking in the right um, 
direction and we find that um, there is a preference for the IHS badge among certain segments of the uh, population. Um, we also find that the effect of the badge is uh, significant positive. So uh, there is um, uh, so there is positive preference. So um, using these results, we are now going to jump into the counterfactuals, and I think I have about eight minutes. Um, so the first counterfactual we have is what happens when um, you change the format of the car safety rating. So if you go from discrete to continuous, what happens to the sales of the cars? Um, so over here there are two plots now, and th this is the most interesting part of the project. So uh, the plot on the left is when uh, the we are not allowing for manufacturers to um, change their response. Uh, um, I mean, respond to the change in the continuous ratings format. So if they keep the prices the same, uh, then uh, you can see that. Uh, uh, so the um, blue dots over here at the bottom are vehicles that are receiving the IHS badge. Uh, the green uh, triangle thingies are vehicles that don't receive the badge. And you can, uh, and the y-axis is the change in uh, the log change in market shares. So uh, you can, so what happens when we uh, change the rating from discrete to continuous is that we are actually allowing for more customer sorting to take place. So basically, cars that did not receive a badge, but uh, people actually found that they were almost as good as a as a car that does receive the badge, their uh, profits could go up as much as 50%. And uh, cars that uh, people realize that got the safety badge, but in the continuous measure are almost as bad as the average unbadged car uh, could lose as much 50% of the um, market share. So now um, if we allow for manufacturers response uh, to uh, making the continuous ratings format available, you can see that the um, the two lines converge closer to each other. But even now, uh, vehicles that people find are almost as good as uh, vehicles that are batched can go up to can increase their market shares to up to 25%. Whereas uh, car when you the reveal uh, when uh, lower quality is revealed for a bashed car, it can lose up to about 30% uh, of its market share. So even in uh, the new equilibrium prices, uh, we uh, find that these uh, there are these um, changes in sales. Um, Sorry for the interruption. You have about yes. five minutes. OK, thank you. Uh, so uh, Another way to look at it is uh, looking at uh, what happens in um, in terms of uh, the economic costs in terms of driver deaths or consumer surplus. So under continuous ratings, uh, with uh, if continuous ratings are made available but prices are not allowed to change, we find that there's about a 7.4 percent. Uh, drop in driver's deaths, which is significant, which comes to about 1850 deaths per year. Um, if you allow for uh, manufacturers to uh, provide, I mean, change their prices in response to the format change, this number comes down to 5.2%, uh, but it's still significant. It's about uh, 1300 lives saved per year. Uh, we also looked at a third version where uh, we don't make the continuous ratings available, but we create a second discrete rating based on the uh, predicted continuous ratings that we had. So it's just a different discrete rating compared to the one that IHS has made available. So just to show that the, we are actually adding in new information. And if you provide the second discrete rating, it's still, it, there are basically better um, rating systems, discrete rating systems even available out there if you were to use 
these continuous uh, measures to create a threshold. We achieve about 3.8% fewer driver deaths uh, if we resort to a different discrete rating system. Um, so what if uh, the other question is what if badge manufacturers reduce effort? Uh, so when you go from discrete to continuous, um, you, some of the manufacturers like Toyota that outperform consistently in quality and they find that the actually uh, they actually don't need to do that much. What if they reduce their effort? Uh, another thought exercise we did was if all the batch manufacturers reduce their safety by a set percentage, they would need to reduce uh, it by nearly 24 percent to uh, offset the reduction in fatalities arising from more informed consumers. So what we're trying to say over here is that um, the uh, to offset uh, the benefits from more information manufacturers will have to drop their safety uh, standards by a huge amount, which doesn't seem to be possible, um, plausible. So um, basically, continuous ratings are uh, better. And this is another demonstration of it in terms of variable profits. Uh, so if um, continuous ratings are made available. There is a significant heterogeneity in variable profits that still remains for vehicles that are aw awarded the safety badge. So this means that even continuous ratings are made available, there are still cars that uh, are currently awarded the safety badge that will find it more profitable to improve their uh, continuous safety rating measure, which again uh, implies that um, it is pro pro probably better to make those continuous ratings available. So uh, just I'm going to shortly conclude. Uh, so what we find is that there is a evidence for um, safety badges from uh, the cu customer's side, which leads to a customer sorting, which uh, accounts for nearly 12.5 percent of the reduction in driver fatalities. Uh, this is um, so we uh, it, using these uh, fatality measures, we construct a continuous safety rating and this score actually leads to improved customer sorting, um, which can lead to a further reduction in driver fatalities, which is a big public policy um, uh, implication. So we find that post ratings might uh, obscure useful information and there is substantial variation that is not reflected currently. And um, what we are suggesting is that agencies don't need to necessarily develop the base, best ratings in house. Uh, open data projects can actually help them out in this case. Um, so that's it from my end. And uh, please let me know if you have any comments or questions, that would be great. All right, if there is no questions from the crowd, uh, let me share my screen. So uh, can you see my screen? Yeah. All right. OK, uh, thanks for a nice presentation, Bumiza. And um, uh, by the way, I, I'm Max Ju from UC Riverside. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers uh, um, to, for allowing me to um, uh, discuss this nice paper um, in my favorite conference. All right, so car safety is, of course, very important because it saves your life. Um, and uh, these crash test ratings um, um, allow you, help you to reasonably predict the actual safety measure. Um, so um, the Insurance Institute of Highway Safety um, tries to increase the face validity of these uh, crash uh, test ratings. So they introduced the new small overlap test in 2012. So it kind of mimics more realistic situation of um, crash between cars. Um, so, and in 2012, uh, the car manufacturers didn't have a, 
a chance to prepare for this test because they didn't announce it. Um, so, um, so some cars um, turned out to be fine, um, but some other cars um, uh, actually might uh, break your legs. Um, so, um, so these car manufacturers, once it is released, and then these car manufacturers actually care about this. And then there are some evidence that the authors um, uh, documented in the paper. Um, but as you can see here, uh, in 2012, uh, Lexus IS showed a very poor small overlap result. And then um, in 2020, um, it doesn't break your legs any longer. Um, so the reason, main reason why they care about this um, is that uh, because uh, is because you care about that, right? And we care about that. Um, so after a week after the small overlap test result was released, uh, Subaru vehicles with um, high rating of small overlap test experienced like a sales increase uh, for that week. Um, on the other hand, uh, Jeep Patriot uh, with very poor uh, small overlap test rating experienced a slight decrease in their demand. Of course, this is just a quick summary of the data set, so it is not scientific measurement. So the authors um, try to formally look at this linkage. Um, so they try to see if uh, the higher uh, safety ratings would lead to higher sales of safer vehicles. And then higher sales of uh, safer vehicles would increase uh, the overall safety on the roadside. And in this linkage, if this safety rating do not well differentiate between safe cars and unsafe cars, then um, despite the existence of these ratings, uh, there is a limited impact of these ratings on the actual safety improvement. Um, so this is the actual current rating scheme. So, um, so Insurance Institute for Highway Safety actually simplified the rating scheme basically for uh, to four star ratings. So good, acceptable, marginal, poor. So it's a four, four, um, four classes. And then uh, they test five different um, crash testing, and then they assign uh, the score for each um, uh, crash test. Uh, so this is mainly because, so they measure a lot as uh, Bumija already explained, um, and uh, this is just to facilitate easier communication with uh, the customers. Um, and um, uh, the Institute actually further simplifies it with a binary um, score, which is top safety fix. So basically, if um, their uh, crash testing passes a certain threshold, and then uh, the, a car would obtain the badge of top safety pick, uh, but if it doesn't pass the threshold, and then the a car does not receive the badge. So it's kind of a zero one binary rating of uh, the safety. So whether it is safe enough or it is not safe enough. So uh, the, the authors actually based on the literature, the authors documented some conditions where these uh, binary ratings um, can be beneficial. Um, so for example, if uh, this top safety pick um, serves as a certain threshold um, so that uh, people would uh, perceive as um, safe enough or not, and then car manufacturers actually invest on the safety to pass the threshold. However, the downside is that in that case, car manufacturers would stop investing on safety after they pass the threshold. So that means uh, the appropriate threshold will be very important. And if the threshold is not appropriate, and then consumers would be better off by just observing raw information in the continuous manner and then um, make the judgment uh, on their own by observing the continuous numbers. Um, so, um, so I think it is reasonable suspicion that uh, they might not have the appropriate threshold. Uh, the first reason is that um, there are so many top safety picks, like 64 in 2020. And the second reason is that uh, there are some cars like uh, Patriot um, who got uh, that got uh, top safety pick, uh, but with these poor ratings on uh, the sub ratings. Um, so especially for the small overlap and the side impact, um, it didn't do well, but still got a top safety pick. So this paper directly answered, as, asks this question. Um, so if the current rating uh, of top safety pick as zero one manner is replaced with a finer continuous rating, and then what will happen 
on the demand side and then corresponding overall fatality um, as uh, a welfare of uh, the entire society. Um, so uh, they first uh, thoroughly documented the industry practice, like the history of uh, all those ratings and uh, the details and some consequences, uh, which I really appreciated. And then uh, first they um, estimated a demand model, uh, which is um, a standard random coefficient logic model. And then as an independent variable, they've used the uh, zero one um, um, uh, crash rating, uh, which is top safety pick. Um, and then they've used um, other product characteristics. And then it is supplemented by um, household micro moments, like um, with the rationale that um, a big household might have the reason to prefer uh, minivans or large SUVs. And they, they've also used uh, product differentiation instruments. Um, so they, uh, it uses uh, objective attribute distances as a similarity measure. And then uh, using similarity measure, uh, uh, you can claim the uh, objective substitutability of horizontally differentiated products. And um, in the calibrated model, uh, the safety ratings of zero or one um, had uh, positive influences on automobile demand. Um, and they created a counterfactual continuous rating, and then it is constructed by um, predicted um, driver's death rate um, of each model year. And um, from the observed, um, driver's death rate, uh, they uh, predicted it on uh, the uh, car characteristics and some controls uh, that Boomi just explained, and uh, they rescaled it uh, as a continuous uh, variable between zero and two, so but slightly higher than two. Um, so two is safer and zero is less safe. Um, so the key of this paper is this counterfactual um, analysis, um, as I understood. So in the counterfactual analysis, they um, replaced the zero one uh, top safety peak variable with uh, their newly created counterfactual continuous rating, uh, which is zero to two. Um, and uh, in the counterfactual demand prediction, uh, demand for cars with low counterfactual ratings and formerly with a top safety peaks badge reduces up to 50%. And demand for cars with high counterfactual ratings but with no top safety peak badge, increases up to 50%. So there was a um, huge discrepancy um, by using different ratings. And with uh, the counterfactual ratings that they created, um, simulated death rates are reduced by 7.4%. And the reason behind it is that uh, with the counterfactual ratings, the cars that are predicted to cause less driver death are sold more. So, so the number of cars that caused uh, that are reduced um, on the road. Um, so their conclusion out of this counterfactual is that um, if, uh, if we use uh, zero one course ratings with some threshold, and then it would not convey the full information to customers, and then uh, customers uh, might not be fully informed to buy better cars. And then um, if you use finer ratings, policymakers um, enforce the finer ratings, and then consumers would, more consumers would buy safer cars, and then eventually that might save lives. Um, so they brought interesting uh, social planner perspective to this domain. So my bottom line interpretation is that um, misleading rating information can reduce social welfare and, uh, of course, and roadside safety. Right, so um, so the authors um, offered um, um, thorough documentation of it, um, um, but I have some um, suggestions um, and questions on uh, demand model identif identification and um, counterfactual analysis. So uh, in reality, if you think about some situation of car purchases, um, then um, it is possible that consumers actually observe actual available finer information, not just the top safety picks. So if you are old school, you would go to dealership and then you might take a look at the, uh, the window sticker um, at the dealership in, on every car, right? And then you would observe these five star ratings on each subdomains um, that are created by the, uh, the, the government agency. Um, and if you are more of an online person, then you would um, compare prices on Edmunds.com. And then uh, the interesting thing in Edmunds.com is that 2021 Kia Soul is actually top safety pick 
But if you go to admins and then you can see these like four star ratings from Insurance Institute. However, you don't see the top safety pick, uh, badge on it. Um, even, even though you can assume that consumers would only rely on the website from Insurance Institute, but if you search for a particular car, uh, they display the information um, all together on the website. Right. So, and authors argue that consumers rely on the top safety picks um, uh, by their empirical test in online appendix. However, the, the hypothesis testing was done, including both ratings in the same model, um, and they are highly correlated. So I don't think um, the, the testing is actually valid. Um, so um, so if, if consumers or some portion of consumers actually observed these binary information like GA and P ratings or five star ratings. And then uh, the model parameters might, um, might suffer some potential problems. So if top safety picks offer um, unbiased categorization with appropriate uh, threshold, and then it still embed some of those measurement errors. So if top, top safety picks variable um, has uh, measurement errors, and then the model parameters will be attenuated, so uh, biased toward zero. So your counterfactual result might be conservative lower bound. Um, however, um, if, if consumer's perception of these five-star ratings um, has deviation from uh, the IIHS's um, threshold to, to make top safety picks, and then it can be viewed as omitted variable bias. So if um, the model suffers omitted variable bias, then the direction of bias is a non-trivial question. So, um, so counterfactual results uh, may be more credible if you can um, address or explain on these issues. And um, this paper actually focuses on the effect of rating format. However, I think the empirical results and counterfactual results uh, may be largely driven by the predictive validity and the unobserved threshold of top safety picks. So the reason why I thought so is that, um, so the counterfactual ratings were constructed by predicted uh, driver death rates. And outcome measures um, in counterfactual, oh, excuse me for the screen. Oops. Excuse me. Let me let me quickly get rid of it. All right. Uh, sorry about the hiccup. All right. So, um, right. So, um, so uh, both counterfactual ratings and outcome measures in the counterfactual analysis are uh, constructed by the same observed data um, of uh, driver death rate. So, by construction, uh, they are um, highly uh, correlated with, with each other. Um, so, uh, improvement in counterfactual prediction may be at least partially attributable toward the low validity of um, top safety picks in predicting fatality rates in each model year. Um, so if that's the case, to isolate uh, the effect of rating format, uh, not the validity of the ratings, uh, then counterfactual ratings need to be constructed um, orthogonally to the observed outcome measures. So for example, uh, the authors might um, consider some raw measures from IIHS or something similar. Um, and another question is that uh, the demand response parameter is calibrated on a discrete variable of 0, 1. However, the counterfactual rating is actually continuous between 0, 2, which is the core of the research. Um, however, um, it is a little bit unclear um, how they managed the calibrated parameters to apply it to uh, the counterfactual analysis with the continuous variables. So if they assumed um, assume the linear responses. And then um, I think on a continuous uh, rating responses, it is possible that demand responses may be non-linear, like consumers might say that like, I'm fine if it is uh, higher than 4.5 or 4.4. 4. 
Um, so uh, like our teaching ratings, um, so uh, it could be a possibility. Um, along the line, so, and, um, so you are using different um, scale ratings. So um, if you change the scale and the response scale, uh, may differ under the new rating scheme. Um, so uh, the same ordering does not necessarily mean that you can apply the same scale. Um, so the sensitivity um, on the calibrated parameter might not hold in the new scale. Um, and a minor suggestion is that uh, uh, given the data set, uh, you have a lot of information in the data set. So I wonder if you can um, test some supply side hypotheses. Um, so a recent paper by Wang and colleagues um, tested, um, tested um, so uh, TripAdvisor ratings, and then they found the competitors' high ratings give pressure to the improved quality. So I think um, uh, the authors can enrich uh, the story by testing the supply side analysis. Um, right, so um, so uh, this is all I have, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I really enjoyed reading the paper, and I uh, learned a lot. Thank hey, you. Thank you. So let me. Um, Max, if you could email me your slides, that would be really great. Like yeah, I tried we'll to note we'll it do. down in real time, but I wasn't fast enough. Will do. Will do. Yeah. Okay. Thank right. you. Right. So, yep. Thank you. Um, any questions? Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, guys. We'll see you all tomorrow. Okay. Thank, right. you. Thank you. See you. See you. Thanks.